The Tolkien Road, Episode 112, Concerning Peter Jackson's The Two Towers. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle Earth. On this episode, we're joined by listeners Josh Sosa and Will Hutton as we take a close look at Peter Jackson's 2002 film version of The Two Towers. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Or you can stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tolkien Road, and you can find us on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road. John here. Greta, how you doing? Hey, hey. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Had a nice little uh, break from recording over the last few weeks. Yeah. And we're doing a special episode on the Two Towers today, and we are joined by two guests, uh, Josh Sosa, who has joined us before on the podcast. Uh, joins us. Hey, Josh. Hey, what's up? It's it's almost been a year, actually, since oh, that it's first been time. that long? That's true. Yeah, it was about yeah. June last hey. year, I think, that we did our episode with you. Wow. Yeah. Um, we're also joined by um, Will Hutton, a.k.a. Dr. William Hutton. Dr. Hutton. Uh, who, I'm sorry, you were, you were telling us before we started recording, and I was kind of busy checking levels and everything, so you've, you've defended your dissertation, so you're almost a doctor. Is that right, William? Will? Um, hey guys, I'm, I'm almost a doctor. I've done all my coursework and I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, defend my dissertation. So it's, it's that one last step where you go convince your committee you, uh, are smart enough to earn the title and they give it to you or they don't and then you are not a doctor. So <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, uh, That's well, great. We're glad you guys could join us. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for the yes, thank you guys. Um, so, as we did, as we did after we finished uh, going chapter by chapter through the Fellowship of the Ring, um, we uh, we 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 watched the Two Towers, Peter Jackson's version of the Two Towers. Uh, as we watched Peter Jackson's version of the Fellowship of the Ring after we finished that, so uh, having just finished the Two Towers, we sat down. We watched uh, the, having finished the book. We sat down and watched the two towers the other night, um, and uh, we watched the extended edition, all four hours. It's epic. It's, it's very long. It's very epic. It didn't feel that long to me, though. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I know that was good. I was kind of like, I got all these like snacks and like was preparing for like a long road trip almost. And uh-huh. I didn't really even eat half of it, so wow. um, I guess that means I enjoyed it. I, that sounds like it. I mean, it's better than being like, it felt like it dragged on forever, you know? Yeah, true. Um, so Josh, you were saying, I asked you, you said that you, cause I, I told you like, as we were watching it, I think, hey, we're watching the extended edition. And you were like, oh, I don't own the extended edition. So you had to watch the theatrical version and then go watch the extended edition scenes on YouTube or something like that, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So when, uh, I, I was just like, vaguely following the dates and I was like oh crap I should probably watch the two towers <laughs> so I spent one day cleaning and I was watching it um and then it was later this week that you were like hey we watched the extended edition uh that's when I realized I don't have that version so I spent two hours yesterday watching all the extended scenes and I see. uh sort of catching up some of those things I had seen before and I think I'd seen them in like uh behind the scenes featurettes or stuff like that but uh there were some that I just had no idea were, were even filmed at all. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, mm. you know, and knowing where they would have fit, uh, mm-hmm. sort of changed my opinion on if I thought they would have worked or if I thought, you know, they added to, uh, why some things didn't show up in Return of the King. Right, right. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I love the fact that they made these extended editions because it's like an hour longer than the theatrical release. And, oh, wow. you know, in my mind, one of the things that I love about Tolkien and his works is how expansive they are. So it just makes it feel that much more expansive. Um, 
Will, what about you? Did you did you watch the extended editions? Um, I did, and um, when Josh said he didn't have it, I thought, how how can you not have the extended edition? <laughs> and then I I was thinking back, you know, because this this movie came out like you know over a decade ago. Yeah. Um, if I remember right, they released the regular mm-hmm. version first. Mm-hmm. And then you had to either wait a couple months or you had to buy it twice right. if you wanted it. So Josh probably bought bought it right when it came out. And I, I'm trying to figure out, like, how you wouldn't get that one. But, um, but yeah, we so, had it, and we actually got the um, surround for it, uh, oh, which is pretty cool. That's nifty. <laughs> Very cool. The uh, Yeah, you know, that when it came out was back in the day when – Blockbuster still existed, you know. So I think we probably just went and rented it from our local Blockbuster, the, the theatrical mm-hmm. version, knowing that the extended edition was going to come, you know, two or three months down the road. And why buy, why buy both of them? Right. Um, Did we not see it in the theaters? We no, we saw. It. No, we definitely saw I it. I think we probably it. saw it twice in the theaters. And then we rented it. Yeah. Okay. And then you bought the extended edition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's. I love the fact that they did these extended editions and, um, you know, I, I, I thought it was appropriate to do the extended edition because even though Jackson said like, well, the theatrical version is really, you know, the, the official version of the film, the extended edition is still exists and it's put out by the company. It's not like it's a bootleg or anything like that. So it is an official version of the film and, you know, it's like they felt it was good enough to release it. So, Mm -hmm. you know. Let's let's use that one. It's got yeah. more in it. So yeah, I'd be interested to know. I kind of I'm a little jealous that Josh got to watch it separately because mm-hmm. I'd be really interested to know what because I just can't remember what was included in theatrical mm-hmm. or what was included well, in the extended that wasn't in the theatrical. Yeah. So maybe as we go through, Josh, you know, you can provide that perspective since I I don't think we're clear because I don't think I've seen the theatrical version probably since. Since I've owned the extended edition, I haven't watched anything but that. So maybe you can, maybe you can, since you watch the extended scene separately, you know, you can provide, if, if we're talking about something that's in the extended edition scenes, the extra scenes, you can provide that knowledge for us. Um, if you can remember. Yeah, sure. Not, yeah, no, well, no pressure. I have, a, like I have a list of, I don't know, what is this, like maybe 10 of them? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Cause I'm pretty positive I didn't see them all. Yeah. Um, oh, but these okay. were the ones that I was that I was able to find on YouTube and that you know I had some opinions of like Old Man Willow I had already known existed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was one of them. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We definitely got to talk about Old Man Willow. But uh, but let's go. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, let's. I thought we'd just go through and you know maybe we could talk about um, the good, the bad, and the interesting. Um, and you know that's 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 how I kind of summarized my thoughts on this. Um, overall, you know, I feel I, I, again like even though there's going to be a, we're going to level a lot of probably there's going to be a lot of criticism leveled at certain things within the films. Overall, I'm very I'm so thankful that these movies exist and uh, and I really think they are pretty incredible and uh, just I, they're just wonderful to have. I, as I said on the Fellowship episode. I might not be a Tolkien fan today if it hadn't been for Peter Jackson's movies. You know, they really got me, got me into that world and got me to read these books, which are daunting at first, um, but you know, it gets you into it and makes you love these characters enough to dive in and find out all the more. So I want to say that as a disclaimer beforehand. Um, I'm extremely thankful these movies exist. Um, I think they're wonderful uh, mm-hmm. on, you know, on whole. Uh, even though there are some things I might take issue with now, because sure. that's what us Tolkien geeks do. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, disclaimer, John. And I uh, listened to the Fellowship uh, movie podcast again, kind of to prepare to mm-hmm. get a feel for what what we might talk about. And I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, I was aware that that uh, Lord of the Rings was an awesome book and all my friends had read it and loved it and I have friends that read it every year and I never read it I didn't even really try to until I, I, I bought the books when the movies were announced so like my copy of Fellowship of the Ring is from like the late 90s mm-hmm. right before the movies came out but um, I love the movies and I got all the extended versions and we watched them you know over and over and over and um, there's a Lord of the Rings card game that I play, so I, I'm a Tolkien fan, but I never had read his books, 
And mm -hmm. um, then when you try to go through and watch the movie and think about, you know, what are we going to talk about? A, a lot of things on my list are things that are uh, in the book but not in the movie. So it'll sound like criticism, but it's it's not. It's just mm -hmm. that I'm such a fan of it. I, I want to see those scenes that are not in the movie. Yeah. So well said. I think it, yeah, it's it's important to, to, to frame it so it doesn't mm -hmm. sound like we're complaining <laughs> for an hour and a half or however long it is about what's not in the movie or what they changed. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to that. But um, yeah, it's important well, to say we're fans. <laughs> right, right. And, um, you know, for me... Like Tolkien, he he spent so much time and put so much detail into these works that uh, you know I would like not every work would I say that the movie has to be extremely faithful to the um, you know what I what I hold it to maybe the standard I hold the Lord of the Rings to um, you know when it comes to adapting a book for a film because not all not all books are as detailed and as rich uh, as Tolkien's works tend to be mm -hmm. um, so yeah that's another just little disclaimer to throw out there. Um, but, uh, uh, so, we're going to look at this, good, the good, the bad, the interesting, um, and I can uh, go ahead, and, and, I, and the other thing I want to make sure we talk about, and we kind of frame this as, is, you know, when we do call out, like, the bad, we talk a little bit about why the filmmaker may have made that decision, you know, because mm -hmm. they don't just make these things, I don't, I don't, I think sometimes you can complain and realize that, and think that, oh, well, they just took the decision, they made that decision lightly, they just felt like we can do whatever we want. And that's not the case. I think Peter Jackson reveres these works. Um, and I think a lot of the decisions were decisions he made because he had <laughs> a huge, a huge film, you know, and the success of these huge films riding on this and, uh, on his, on his work. And so I don't think he made any of the decisions that we're going to complain about lightly. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, so that's probably enough disclaimers. Good, the good, the bad, and the interesting. Yeah. And one thing I was just that I wanted to do, but I didn't have time, um, is I think there's several different uh, audio commentary tracks, and I think one is with Peter Jackson. Mm. So it would be good to go back maybe after the podcast and try to um, see if we get any insight from the you know the decisions he made. I think he he may explain some of that in the commentary, but I I haven't gotten to it yet. That's a great point. Um, at some point, I need because there's. And the other thing with these extended editions is there's a ton. There's like two extra discs of just like extra behind the scenes footage uh, that I've barely even watched over the years. And at some point, I need to just go back and watch those things because they look. A lot of them look pretty pretty incredible. And um, uh, and 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 I would love someday to maybe go through and actually listen, like watch the movies with the commentaries turned on. Um, <laughs> You know, so that we can, you know, really hear from his perspective, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, why he made the decisions he did. So, and and also along with his other writers and the and producers, um, who are I think Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens. So, um, anyway, all right. So the good. I'll start off with one, and maybe we can go around and just name off a few, and then we'll you know hit the bad and the interesting too. Sounds like a plan. Um, so the first one I'd call out. Uh, is the music? Um, no, <laughs> sorry, you Josh. took trashes. <laughs> took mine. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, well, and, and definitely, you know, I want to hear what you say, what you had to say about it, Josh. But uh, the music for all the movies is just fantastic. Um, music can make or break a movie, and uh, you know, as you all know, as Star Wars fans, um, the and the Rohan theme in the movie is. One of my favorites here. Um, I love the the kind of the fiddle the fiddle theme they they employ kind of in all the different mm -hmm. Rohan scenes. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like in the first movie you had those classic you had the the concerning hobbits theme, which becomes this motif all throughout the series, um, all throughout the trilogy. You have um, the I think it's the One Ring theme the. Um, that becomes a motif all throughout it. So there's just all these classic things. And then, you know, on top of that, it's like they could have just used everything they already had in the Fellowship of the Ring and it would have been fine. Mm -hmm. But kind of like with Star Wars introducing the Imperial March and the Empire Strikes Back, right? You know, they just, they up the, they up the ante here with the music. So, um, Howard Shore, just brilliant work as far as the music goes, uh, in my opinion. Josh, yeah, do you want to, do you want to make, since you were, 
shook your head when I said that. Go ahead. I, we'll, we'll turn it over to you here. Uh, no, well, um, for me, this is uh, Howard Shore. Howard Shore's scores for uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy is uh, they're probably the only film scores that are above John Williams scores of Star Wars for me. Mm. Um, wow, you would say above. Yeah. Wow. Um, I think I said that last year too when we had our discussion. Yeah, I, I think um, I remember that. Yeah. But it, yeah. for me, um, I, I don't watch, you know, I don't watch Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, uh, Harry Potter. I don't watch them as much as I probably would like to. Um, but I would sit there and I'll go on Spotify and I'll listen to the entire soundtrack of any given film. And what makes it a great piece for me is you can throw me in the middle of any piece in the score and I can tell you the dialogue. I can tell you exactly what's going on. Yeah. Like it's, um, I, I, I use it as a fun fact for work and stuff like that. But, um, that's when I really am like, wow, I'm, I'm completely involved in the story and I, yeah, I, I feel it, you know. And then when you couple that with the cinematography, when they do these long shots of um, of the New Zealand landscape, as mm-hmm. you know, they're going across it. Like it's perfect, you know. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's one of those things where you can have this silent film, and you don't need the dialogue at all to tell you what's going on because the music will do it for you, and uh, the, the actors will supplement it, and all this stuff. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, Concerning Hobbits is probably one of my favorite mm. pieces from the Lord of the Rings. Anytime uh, that comes up and a lot of this rural music comes around in uh, in Lord of the Rings or in The Hobbit as well, uh, very early on, um, those are my favorite pieces. Um, and so it was great, too, when I was watching the uh, extended scenes, which I had never seen before, and there's stuff like... Uh, the theme for Gondor coming up, and you don't really have that at all until you get to Return of the King, where it's all over Minas Tirith and Asgiliath, and right. uh, because they don't make so much of an appearance in the Two Towers film, because uh, I don't even think in the Siege of Asgiliath there's anything like that. Um, like it, it tells you exactly who you're going to see. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. this is this is who uh, this scene involves and what's going to happen. Uh, the same thing with the ring motif or. Um, with uh, Elrond and Galadriel's themes, you know, those tell you exactly what's going on and uh, what everything is concerning itself with at the time. I think it's great. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Would, any, anything else you want to add to that or just disagree? No, if, I, if I disagree. Fine, I yeah. disagree. Music was actually not on my list. I think mm. I kind of took it for granted, but now hearing, you know, I mean, I always enjoy it, but I yeah. didn't like. Analyze well, it, and, it, I guess, and it's not necessarily it. something you always consciously right. you, you yeah. consciously realize, but there are so many memorable, uh, memorable themes, memorable motifs in terms of music in this film series. Uh, the Rohan one, especially like in this one, because one of my favorite scenes not not in this one, but you know when we get to Return of the King, it'll be I'll probably cry when we talk about this scene. But the uh, the, the charge, you know, yeah. the, the ride of the Rohirrim. Um, when they when they rehash that theme, it, you know, it's part of that, and you're just like, I mean, you know, I get all misty eyed when I watch that. It's just so amazing. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so Will, uh, you you are welcome to continue talking about music if you want to, or you can offer up another uh, good point of the films of the film. Um, well, I'll I want to try to frame it a little bit from the reference of of being just such a huge fan of the movies for so long and then finally reading the book and and then when I watched the movie after I read the book I kind of felt like I got a lot more of the um, they weren't inside jokes or references or things like that but I I felt like I was enjoying a whole nother like 50% of the movie Mm -hmm. you know even though Mm -hmm. I already loved it yes and um, there's two things I want to talk about kind of in relation to that in the the first is a real quick one that I think Josh will appreciate. Um, so the, the the very beginning scene of the movie, uh, they're panning over the the snowy mountains, and that that shot just goes on forever. Oh. And um, before I read the book, I I just like oh, there's some mountains. <laughs> I didn't really know that it was uh, Caradhras, and I um, it, it reminded me of the intro to Star Wars when they pan across the Death Star and it just keeps going and going and you're like, well, why are they showing this mountain for so long? You know, because the scenery is beautiful and 
New Zealand or something. But with the voiceover and then after reading the book, I'm like, okay, they're showing you the passage that the, the company took through Moria and how it was like 20 miles or more that they traveled underground, mm -hmm. which was, you know, in the previous book. But there's nothing really to indicate that other than a little bit of the voiceover of the fight with um, Gandalf and the Balrog. So, you know, if you haven't read the book and you maybe are just kind of a, a casual watcher of the movies, they're just snowy mountains to you, and that's that's it. Mm -hmm. And there's such a depth of everything that um, the movies really settle with. If um, you know, once you've read the books and listen to your podcast every week and put a lot of effort into it, you start to the movie reveals more. You know, there's more to see. I think that's interesting. Oh yeah. yeah so um, and then then the other thing is just I love the the brace of conies <clears throat> scene yes. out of um, oh yeah stewed rabbit. <laughs> so we watched this with my kids, um, you know, a while ago, and they go out of their way to call potatoes taters <laughs> so <laughs> so the other uh, what's taters precious yeah exactly yeah what's taters precious <laughs> and they crack themselves up and it's just so funny and and when i was reading the book i that scene is like not just word for word in there but it, it goes on for like pages mm -hmm. which is kind of cool so yes. um I do like that scene in the movie. It's probably one of my favorite scenes just because of the, the connection to our family. So it's, yeah. I like that a lot. Definitely, we quote that one. Um, <laughs> I, we, we, we quote, uh, what is it, uh, potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mash them, put them in a stew. You know, we, that's, uh, we always say potatoes. potatoes. Uh, I think that's a frequent thing that we quote in our house. I, yeah. I, our kids haven't seen the movies. Um, I'm, I'm a stickler for like, We'll let them, we'll tease parts of it for them, but I won't let them watch it until they read it. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I'm trying to oh, get wow. them to, um, you know, I might break on that at some point just, <laughs> just because I know I didn't read them until I watched it, but what can I say? I'm a, I'm, you know, that's me. That's me as a dad. Um, uh, but great. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, and on your point of the mountains, the, the layout, just New Zealand again, visually beautiful. It, mm -hmm. it is Middle Earth in our world. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just a magnificent place, the, the landscape. And I love your point about these, these look like just regular mountains. You might, well, not regular mountains, but mountains you might see somewhere in our world. But as you watch the film, having read the books and all that kind of stuff, you realize this is the Misty Mountains, you know, and you're like, that's a, that's a lot like probably what Tolkien envisioned the Misty Mountains looking like. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and you know, uh, part of that gets replicated in uh, Return of the King, where uh, when Pippin finally lights the beacon of Gondor, and you have that whole scene where every beacon is being lit between uh, between Minas Tirith and uh, they're at Edoras, I believe. Um, uh, they're back in Edoras, yeah, wherever it is, Helm's Deep or Edoras or wherever. Yeah, it is, so. and again, you know, you uh, sure if you have a map, you can tell how far these two cities are from each other, but. Uh, having a visual layout like this is it's miles across and it's this really intricate uh, signaling system that they have it might seem mm -hmm. basic but um, it's at particular points you know across mountain ranges across the land that will be spotted you know even if uh, happenstance you know there aren't people at the next gate to like the next beacon you know things will get passed along that's why it's so significant when it does happen uh, because I, I feel like a lot of things that happen uh, in the films, yes, they're expanded upon uh, from the books, uh, like like Helm's Deep, for example. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, it, it's meaningful in, in the visual aids and, and how it's being portrayed. Mm -hmm. That really gets across. This is, and for the film itself, like this is... This is New Zealand, but you're in Middle Earth, and you you are seeing Middle Earth, and you are being thrusted into mm -hmm. the path of, you know, what may be going on in this time period or such. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, also also beautiful and oh, just magnificent, magnificent landscape. Mm -hmm. Did you mm -hmm. did you have a good item you wanted to? Yeah, mention? I wanted I wanted to call out the um, the scene of Gandalf the White when he comes back. Um, I thought that was just really well done. Because mm -hmm. um, you know he first appears. Um, to Mary and Pippin, right? And you don't see his face. All you see is, like, the back of him. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was reading the book, it had been so long since I'd read it, 
before, I had forgotten that Gandalf comes back. And at first I thought, oh my gosh, it's Saruman. Like, Saruman's yeah. here. And I totally got that same feel- feeling in the movie. I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, it's Saruman. Um, I thought they did it so well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when they finally pan around and he greets, you know, Aragorn and Legolas, and they obviously think it's Saruman. Um, and, um, and then they just, you know, they pan out and you see him. And he totally looks just how I pictured him. Like, yeah. just big and tall and glowing and glorified and, a, you know, a better version of his old self. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just really liked the way they did that. I thought it was really true to the book, and it kind of evoked the same emotions mm-hmm. when I saw it than when I read it. I did uh, a great point. I think um, I like I like adding to that, I like the, uh, the flashback they show of Gandalf smoting the Balrog on top of uh, the peak. Is it is it the peak of Carothras? That he does it um, wherever he, he is the climb. You know they don't show him climbing mm-hmm. up the the staircase, but they show him on the peak of the mountain where he you know where he does it. So I love that they showed you know they showed little, this little Gandalf guy going up against this huge Balrog, and you know he 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 smokes the Balrog, you know, and then he and then he passes out of like time and memory, um, you know, into the into the deeps of time, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I, on that note, I, a little quick. It, this, this isn't really a huge thing. I was actually going to mention this in the interesting, but since we're talking about Gandalf, did anybody pick up where he talks about uh, having been in Middle Earth for like three hundred lives of men? Yeah, yeah, I heard that. I tried to do the yeah. tried to do the math in my head, and I was like, oh, that's, "That's really well, long." So if you assume that, <laughs> even if you assume a lives of men of like sixty years, like a lifespan of men, or even let's just say let's just say forty years, right? Because that's like a generation in the Bible, right? Um, uh, that would be like twelve thousand years. So he, Gandalf has not been in Middle Earth for twelve thousand. years. I remember, yeah, I remember him saying that, and I was like, "Whoa!" Like I knew he was old, but is he like really that old? Yeah, yeah. Well, and those that might be a, a underestimate of the age too, right? Because I don't were, were all men Dunedain, and then there was like a, a branch. No, or, there were men in. Middle Earth, like when when the men did rise, there were separate men from from what we know to be the Numenorians and such that did eventually come over to Middle Earth, right? Because the uh, the Haradrin and the other wild men, they were there. They were uh, a pre existing okay. community, mm-hmm. uh, along with I believe the early Rohirrim as well. Mm. Yeah, you're right. So, so there were there were like different species of men. Is that right then? Not different species or, per se. What 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 happened? Like men men were you know men were all men, and then you have the friends of the elves in the first age, who are rewarded after the fall of Morgoth. They're rewarded oh, for okay. uh, for their friendship and their kind of standing fast with the elves by being given long life and being able to dwell in this land of Numenor, which is. Like just just out of reach of Valinor, but it's it's of the Blessed Realm, but it's much closer to the Blessed Realm than um, than the rest of Middle Earth is. So they're given okay. this land, and they're separate. And that's the, that's who the Numenorians, the Dúnedain, are. Um, they're so they're normal men, but they've been kind of blessed with longer life than normal men. Three three times the lifespan of normal men. Um, right. Okay, the, and that's why point. I was wondering if if you know how that worked out. If maybe we were you know off by it factor three but doesn't sound like it <laughs> yeah i mean the best even the conservative estimate is that gandalf by that is like in 12 has been there for twelve thousand years and it's like and, and i don't know maybe 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 he meant that he's just been around for twelve thousand years which that's possible because you have the third age three thousand years you have the second age three thousand years and the first age is only like 500 years and then you've got all the prehistory that you know of all the ages before the time the, of trees, the time of lamps, right? Which no one knows how long those things were really. Yeah. Um, so you you know, and he is a Maiar, so it could be that he's just referring to how long he's existed in the world. Um, but uh, anyway, I was kind of doing the math, and I was like, well, if it's meant to imply that he's been around Middle Earth for three hundred lives of men, that's just not possible. Right. Like, men, men have not yeah. been around that long. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's um, in general. Like yeah. he's existed. Anyway, I, it, you know, that's I don't want to quibble too much on that, but um, just you we were talking about Gandalf, talking so about I, Gandalf, I thought about that. And, uh, but yeah, Gan- Gandalf overall, I think uh, his transformation into Gandalf the White mm-hmm. um, 
is uh, is done well. Um, it uh, it makes me think a little bit of. I think I've heard Ian McKellen, who of course portrays Gandalf, talk about uh, how he prefers Gandalf the Grey to Gandalf the White. You know, because uh, he felt like Gandalf the Grey was a little bit uh, mm-hmm. more human and more fun. Yeah, you know? yeah, I, I, yeah. But that's I that's the, that. that's. That's the character, right? That's not right. that's not the portrayal necessarily, um, right. or, or anything like that. I mean, McKellen does an amazing job, you know, of portraying. Gandalf, oh, absolutely, no absolutely. So. Oh, this was funny when we were one of our kids was watching a little bit of it, and Gandalf came in, and he was like, "That looks like Dumbledore." Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hurt. <laughs> He's nine, so don't take it too personally. <laughs> and he's a Harry oh. Potter fanatic, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, just uh, a little note on the Dumbledore scene. That's the only time that we have uh, some sort of external divine force coming in throughout the whole of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, if I recall. What, which, what are you referring to? Uh, Gandalf uh, the White. His, his dialogue saying they sent me back or uh, and the whole scene of him being reborn Mm -hmm. you don't get that at all throughout the Lord of the Rings Um, I mean you get like you get Frodo's line in Shelob's lair when he's calling out to Varda but uh, there's nothing that explicitly tells you that there's more than just Middle Earth in the films Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's that's the only piece of divine intervention that you have Mm -hmm. whereas in the books you you have awareness that at least in Lord of the Rings, you have awareness that there are other beings yeah. that have governance over the world and that uh, Iluvatar has purposefully influenced actions throughout the story. Uh, but yeah, that's the only time that you get any hint of that. Um, Good point. And I, yeah. think, I, I think of the of the hints of a larger universe for Lord of the Rings, that's the one that I'm okay with. Um mm-hmm. Because a lot of those hints are sprinkled throughout the extended scenes, and I, I have issues with that. But we'll get to that when we get to those scenes. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. I was going to say there's there's a reference to the grace of the Balar when Arwen, uh, in that scene where Aragorn falls and um, mm-hmm. and then he wakes like Arwen mm-hmm. kind of mystically wakes him up. Um, there's a reference to she she says something about the grace of I mean, the grace of the Balar. Right, but is that is that in the book? Like no, I didn't think so. Well, there's okay. the whole Arwen. We'll Arwen talk about that later. Thing. Yeah, yeah, but um, okay. Um, another another good. Um, so I'll go with uh, I'll go with just Helm's Deep and the battle. Um, you know, I think you mentioned a little bit about that, Josh. But just the layout after having gone through that chapter in detail mm-hmm. and kind of studied how Tolkien describes the layout of Helm's Deep and really understood it uh, or attempted to to grasp it and understand it from his uh, verbal description, I thought they did a great job of, yeah, of I totally agree. laying that out and of showing it. Mm-hmm. Um, probably mm-hmm. in large part thanks to the works of like Alan Lee and others who yeah. are the Matt, visual interpreters. John Howe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Um, I thought that was really well done. Yeah, so beautifully done. And the battle, I think, you know, the, the course of the battle isn't isn't 100% faithful to the story, but I think kind of the the, the different narrative points, the major narrative points of the battle are are pretty well worked mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I agree. Yeah, that was one. Of the, I had that on my list too. Okay. I really like the way because I I had a hard time. I'm not a map studier. Like I don't read maps as well as you do, and it was hard for me to visualize like just what Helm's Deep looked like and how the battle, you know, played out. So. um like you said, I know the actual battle wasn't super faithful, but I, I thought that was really well done. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I felt like, um, I was like, oh, okay, that's, you know, I had kind of a vague notion of what I thought it might look like and all that, but once I saw the movie, I was like, okay, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it, it seems to be done well. Um, so, uh, Will, uh, what about you? What's another good point for you? So I, I really liked how they did that, uh, battle as well but I picked out some some really small details that um, I really enjoyed after uh, reading the book and then watching the movie again and um, there's a scene where Aragon meets uh, Hama's son which I thought was really neat um, mm-hmm. and Hama was the guy that let um, Gandalf and everybody in to um, uh, is it Theodred? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Thayden, yeah. So um, I thought that was really neat where he he inspired him because he was you know, he was nervous about the fight, and he said, well, let me see your sword. And he, mm-hmm. he kind of bolstered his courage by just commenting on how great his rusty, dinged-up sword was. And it yes. was a pretty terrible-looking sword to me. It was pretty bad-looking. <laughs> <laughs> well, a whole lot of notches Aragorn. and nicks and everything in it, yeah. Yeah, 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 but Aragorn's like, hey, this is a great sword, and, you know, as long as you've got this great sword, you're going to do fine. And mm-hmm. I, I really like that scene of mm-hmm. um, how Aragorn was able to inspire and lead and, and give courage to someone. Yeah. And and similarly, there's a scene with um, Legolas and Gimli uh, towards the end of the battle when Legolas apologizes for uh, despairing. Uh, yeah. and he tells Aragorn he was wrong to despair. Mm-hmm. And I... It's just like a couple of words, but it's it's the heat of battle, and they're they're going through this incredible fight, and it was just uh, I, I just like how inspiring those characters are it, with just a few words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, in our world, I think there's a lot of times we are wrong to despair mm-hmm. over you know very little things, and we you know there's we have a lot to to be thankful for, especially just you know kinship and. I think I just think the movie captures that really well, yeah. and I like those two scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful scenes. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, you know the humorous competition between well, somewhat humorous. It's in the heat of battle, but between Gimli and Legolas. Oh yeah, let's. Well, in- that was yeah. that was done really well too. With their, you know, how they're competing over how many orcs they felled. Mm-hmm. That was, that was yeah, de- definitely you know great, and and you know it's it's in the book as well, so mm-hmm. it's great that it, it translates so well to the to the film. But just that little point, you know. Of, kind of constant comic relief yeah. of like you know yeah. I've, I've killed more works than you have you know right. they're just going back right. and forth and they're and seeing their friendship really really take off in that way you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. Um, and that I, I'm always I always get misty eyed too when I think of like the friendship of like uh, of like warriors like the, the kinship of men who are fighting for the same cause in the heat of battle you yes. know and um, yeah. and the way that can bond people mm-hmm. you know from extremely diverse backgrounds um, uh, and it's you know well done in the film. Yeah, absolutely. So. Absolutely. I agree. Josh, yeah. your turn for the good. Any any other good items you wanted to point out? Um, ooh, good items. Uh, as I scrolled down my email and realized I was highly critical of this film. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I thought um, the acting choices, I thought uh, Bernard Hill and Miranda Otto, I thought were great. as failed in and uh, Eowyn. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, overall, of the important characters who are new to the film, uh, with Carl Urban as uh, Aomer and uh, David Wenham as uh, Farmer, I thought they all did great, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in the roles that they were given to play in the adaptation of those roles. Right. Uh, yeah. Those adaptations in particular, I don't feel too great about some of them, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get I, we'll get to the we'll get to those in just a moment. I, uh, I, you know, some of the portrayal. The, the writing for some of the characters, um, you know, in, uh, in just a moment. But uh, no, so I, we're I agree. The act about Faramir, right? No, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. we, yeah. We need to talk about Faramir. We'll talk about Faramir. Uh, the choice, <laughs> the choices of the actors, though, I agree. I, I liked. Um, I can't think of anybody who I would like criticize in terms of like, major, major character. I can't even think of really any minor characters that I would criticize the choice of um, right. in terms of the actor. Yeah, um, I thought as, as despicable as he is, I thought Warm. Worm, what's his face? Wormwood or uh, worm, worm, worm tongue? Worm tongue. Thank you. I'm getting straight to Not not worm tail, as you as you might think, because you read Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. You know, because I read Harry Potter, and there's also a uh, worm something in Screw Tape, isn't there? There's like a wormwood. Wormwood. See, yeah. I'm getting them all. I'm getting all the worms confused. <laughs> um, yeah. What is it? Worm tongue. Worm 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 tongue. Worm Grima. tongue. Grima. Yeah, worm I thought tongue, yeah. he he was fantastically evil. Yeah. I mean, I oh, think he nailed his role. And that's also, that's also like when Andy Serkis became immense because of his role as Gollum. I know. Uh, and ever oh. since, he's been playing these great uh, motion capture characters throughout a whole bunch of different franchises. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, you know, I'm excited to see War of the Planet of the Apes when he comes back as playing Caesar again because he just does such a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, he did. Uh, he did the big monkey too, right? Didn't he? Wasn't he King Kong that he just did, came out? He did Peter. Uh, no, he did Peter Jackson's King Kong. Oh, okay. I thought he did the Kong, Kong Skull Island Kong too. 
But, no, yeah, he he did Peter Jackson's Kong. Uh, he Supreme Leader Snoke in The Force Awakens. Yep. Uh, who looks yeah. like who looks like giant Gollum to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> I, when I saw that character, I was like, he just looks like a giant, more civilized Gollum to me. But uh, when I and it was funny because I knew Andy Serkis was uh, playing that character. But uh, but yeah, Gollum like. Gollum is so good. Like, the mm-hmm. portrayal of Gollum in these movies is just, they nailed it with that. And yeah. Andy Serkis deserves a lot of the credit. It's uh, one of those uh, acting choices and performances. And, uh, I mean, everything. Even, you know, you needed the CGI to do that. You needed the actor. You needed everything. Without all of those things put together, I mean, the whole film franchise might have fallen apart. Because, sure, mm-hmm. you know, Sir Ian McKellen is great. And, uh... Uh, Sean Astin is great and you know uh, Orlando Bloom and uh, all these you know all these actors are fantastic but uh, for key characters mm-hmm. like Gollum mm-hmm. it would have just collapsed without him mm-hmm. yeah agreed yeah I mean it's a pivotal part yeah yeah it's it, even like the voice <laughs> I think the like the voice so much of it is yeah. like he just nails the he voice of Gollum voice. so yeah. well I mean, that voice is iconic I know mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think he uh, for there were a couple of award ceremonies while the Lord of the Rings was uh, was out in theaters and such like that. Like I think during the Oscars they had like Gollum accept an award or something like that. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, I I think I, I remember that for me. I was like I was like it's almost like when it suddenly becomes that iconic, you're like, well, darn. Like it's like it's it's not just. It's not just, it doesn't be, just belong to Tolkien fans anymore. It's become like part of the broader culture. So like everybody, yeah. everybody knows Gollum is that character now. And it's, and it, you know, to the point of like, you're right. Like he's going to show up in like different places, just completely outside the context of the Lord of the Rings. And you're like, I kind of wish that didn't happen because that kind of, it does something to the character at that point. But I don't know. At some point. Yeah, but it, it, it's going to become a part of pop culture. It's exactly. Like why, you know, for the past, 40 years, you know, people have been, you know, getting oxygen tanks out when they want to sound like Darth Vader, you right. know. <laughs> that's uh, true. People are doing true. all these different types. Like, it's going to be, you know, something amazing that's going to be timeless. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's yeah. true. Um, well, a couple of last notes on the good, and then and I'll we'll move on to the next stuff, unless anybody else has interesting, anything for the good. Um, I liked, I thought the Black Gate scene was, was amazing. I love the, the portrayal of the Black Gate. Does um, Frodo really fall like that in the book? Like, no. does he come that close to actually like being found, and they have to use the invisibility? No, I think that's okay. I think that's a little bit. There's a lot of that in the movie where um, they just kind uh, of like, expand it. And well, what exaggerate. Jackson? I think in the interest of making of making the movie as conflict filled and mm-hmm. um, and kind of you know the the risk I think you run as a filmmaker. I think that I think what filmmakers are taught these days is like you have to keep people interested. You can't. You gotta, you gotta not, you gotta be careful about quiet moments, and um, because people can lose, can lose interest really easily. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm speculating. That's not. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not an expert on filmmaking by any means. But um, I feel like there was a lot of that going on in the movie where there were like little points of conflict that weren't necessarily mm-hmm. there in the in the book mm-hmm. that are sensationalized and you know even added gotcha. to in order to make there be a little more conflict. But I just loved the look of the Black Gate, and I loved that mm-hmm. kind of the. How they showed all the orcs and the and the trolls being used to open the gates and just little details that they added to it that aren't necessarily in the book but aren't but don't um, distort the book in right. any way. Don't detract. You know, yeah. just the magnificence the magnificence of this giant gate at the mm-hmm. in these you know in these mountains. I thought was really cool. I also loved the um, the flying black riders, um, the the creatures that they ride. The Nazgul. Yeah, um, and um, and then just the dynamic of the relationship between. Gollum, Frodo, and Sam. Yeah, um, that was very that well. Was captured mm-hmm. pretty darn well. Mm-hmm. So, just just Sam's kind of hesitancy to trust him, and right, Frodo's more willing. You know, his willingness. Frodo's to Frodo's seeing in him like yeah. you know, there's something there's something in him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's like a fellow Hobbit about him, and maybe he can be redeemed. Right. Maybe he can be right. You know, brought back. Um, yeah. From what he's become. Do uh, Do you guys think that the um. The Frodo's already feeling the pull of the ring and feels it corrupting him, and he's giving Gollum this. Um, I think Gandalf called it pity in the first book uh, because he's gonna want and need that from uh, Sam and everybody else 
when maybe he becomes mm. like Gollum. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. So, so, it, so I, I'm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're asking, Will. I, okay, so, well, so, I, you know, I, I feel like Frodo is feeling the, the weight of the ring and it's, mm-hmm. and it's influence on him and that it's a bad thing and that Frodo can see his future in, uh, Gollum. So Frodo is, is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, He's more apt to be you know, compassionate and understanding. Right. Because he's, a, exactly. he's afraid because that he's, he's going to end up like that, and he wants people right. to treat him the way that he's treating all Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. I think, I think yeah. one of the things I appreciate about yeah. it is, like, the, um, Frodo is, he, in the book, it's clear that he can sympathize with Gollum in a way that, um, Sam can't. Right. 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 Um, because he's he knows the weight of the ring and what it can do yeah, to you. Yeah, what it can do. Uh, yeah. And I think that's a key... I think that's a key reason why... Yeah, I think that's something they do well is like, you know, Frodo, at the same time, he knows that he can't completely trust Gollum. He's able to... He's able to do... He's able, he's able to trust him in certain ways that Sam is not comfortable with because he knows... He, he has an appreciation for Gollum's psyche, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, because he's experienced it himself, what, what the ring does to you. Yeah. I, agree. I, I think they handle that very well. In yeah, terms of no, the I, yeah. I think it would be, I think it would be a letdown if they did not, mm-hmm. you know, if they didn't do that well, if it was something different. Right. But, yeah. Right. And I think the audience is probably most or more apt to relate to Sam's point of view. Oh, that, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's just kind of an interesting, you know, kind of, like you want to be compassionate, like Frodo, but you just you 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 don't you can't relate to mm-hmm. what he is going through, what Gollum has been through, and so you're more apt to identify it, with it, Sam's reaction. And at the same time, that's part of the brilliance of the Gollum portrayal is like he he still is he still has Hobbitish qualities to him, and so mm-hmm. even though he's become this despicable, he's he's, he's a murderer, he is a sneak. Uh, he's, he's slinker and stink, you know, slinker mm-hmm. and stinker is, yeah. um, is Sam calls him, right? Even so, you can still see something in him that, you know, mm-hmm. you're, that you can sympathize with and even you're kind of like, you know, he still is kind of, there, there's, I, I don't know if you can call it innocence, but there's something in him that's a little bit, that's small. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you, you realize that he's a victim, you know, just as much as, just as much as he's responsible for the things he's done, but he's a victim at the same time. And I think, being able to show somebody is both because I mean that's what evil does to all of us right like you know one of the things that's so wonderful about Tolkien's works is that portrayal that we're responsible for the things we do but we're also victims when we choose when we choose the wrong steps we're victimized by that right. uh, we're distorted and 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 broken by that right um, well, so. that's something else that was I thought was done really well with just Gollum in general was the Schmeagol versus Gollum, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the the, the, the dialogue, split, the split personality yeah, the split personality scene. dialogue. I thought was really well done. Well, I was gonna, uh, I was gonna cover that when we get to the interesting. Uh-huh. Um, Sorry, maybe we can. No, no, you're good. Maybe we, maybe we'll come back to that when we get to the interesting. Okay. Um, because I wanted to, because that's not in the book necessarily. That like one was. scene. Well, there's different, there's different little tastes of it, but the way it's done. Oh, I see what you're saying. It was kind of cut. And I guess, I guess, yeah, I guess it's a little bit in the book, but. I don't know. Let's, let's come back. Let's come back to that. It's in there. Okay. Yeah. Want to arm wrestle about it? Or we can do rock paper scissors because I would definitely beat you in arm wrestling, and that might embarrass you in front That's of Josh. True. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> All right. The bad. Uh, who wants to start off with something bad? Bad to the. Bad. I think Will's dying to talk about Farmir. <laughs> Will. I was going to give some space for someone to to bring it up first. <laughs> but I think we all might be want to talk about that. Um. So, there, you know, the, there's, I'm trying to think how to, how to even put this. Um, there's, there's a lot of, I think, important things in the book that got cut for some mm-hmm. reason. And I'll, I mm-hmm. kind of want to talk about how, how they made Faramir so much weaker in the movie mm-hmm. and, and use a really kind of, I think, subtle example. Um, everywhere the hobbits are going, they're, they're constantly being blindfolded. You know, like when they go through Lothlorien mm-hmm. and when Faramir brings them into the, um, their, I forget the name of their hiding spot, but it's that, that gap in the rocks. The, the window on the west, I guess, is, is the... 
Yeah. So, so they're, and you know, they're, it's, there's always this scene where like, well, we're allies, but we don't trust you. And so you're going to have to trust us and we're going to blindfold you and bring you into our, our little secret spot in Middle Earth. And the scene where they get Smeagol and in the pool, you know, Frodo, because they, they're going to blindfold him too. In the movie, they throw a bag over Gollum's head and they all just trot off with mm-hmm. him. But in the book, Frodo's like, hey, go ahead and blindfold me first and show mm-hmm. Gollum that it's okay. And, mm-hmm. and maybe Gollum will trust me and then we can all trust you. So they, right. they cut a lot of that out mm-hmm. of the movie, mm-hmm. even to the point where, uh, when Faramir's discussing Frodo's mission with him and Frodo kind of lets it slip that he's got the ring and then Faramir lets him go. And instead of, you know, saying, well, we're going to take this ring and we're going to, I'm going to bring it back and this is my chance to look good in front of my dad, you know, Denethor. Um, the, the movie added all that and I kind of felt mm-hmm. like it, it, it didn't really make the movie better and it really weakened the character compared to the book version of Faramir. So there's, yeah. I'm sure there's lots of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, spot on, right? Like Faramir, that, that may be the single biggest problem with this movie is like the portrayal of Faramir. Like, cause he is such, you read the book and I mean, it's, it's clear, like there's certain characters that you're like, it's, it's kind of like emphasis and that kind of thing. Um, you know, different, difference in emphasis, difference in the way the character was maybe adapted. But this one, you're just like, okay, there's definitely, Book Faramir and there's movie Faramir and they're two different characters. Like, book Faramir is this just shining, like, uh, paragon of like, goodness, uh, virtue and, and goodness and, uh, and just everything like a good warrior should be. And, um, and he's not even a war, like he's, he even says like, I'm not even, I'm not really even a warrior. I just happen to find myself in circumstances to be one. Um, but he's just, he's like this ultimate, uh, he, he's he's almost like if Bar if Baramir for all of his goodness and his good points who who falls, uh, it's almost like it, it's almost like the old Adam versus the new Adam, right? It's like you know Boromir falls and Faramir is the is the new Adam, the one that doesn't fall, right? Yeah. Um, Boromir the White. <laughs> yeah, you know he's yes, in the in the yes. book he's such a uh, he's such an incredible and uh, virtuous character. And in the movie, he's just suspicious, and he's like, he's got this father wound, and yep. um, he's got the little brother complex. He's got the little brother complex, yeah. um, and he's he's pretty, you know, not, I don't know if you want to go so far as saying cruel, but he's borderline cruel to the hobbits, and just distrustful, and and just not even really that wise, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's all those, he's all the opposites of those things in right. the book. In the book, absolutely, yeah. The one good thing I want to call out in the midst of all this criticism is I think he was cast well. Mm-hmm. I think you could see that he and Boromir clearly would be related. And I think it, it's been a while since I've watched the movie, the Return of the King movie, but I think I think some of it's turned around in his portrayal in the in that in that movie. Um, I think he's a little bit more. There's certain, I think there's still some problems with him. Come to think of it, but but at least you know he kind of ends up in a better place. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just. Yeah. It's hard to watch after having just read the books and with Faramir mm-hmm. and his and who he really is in the books to see what becomes of him there. Um, I'm not really sure why Jackson felt the need to write him that way. Yeah. Other than just feeling like there needed to be more conflict. Um, you know, yeah, drawing yeah. out. These, bo- these books are not easy <clears throat> to adapt to films. I know uh, yeah, no, We talked agree. about some of that yeah. the other night. Like in, yeah. in a film, you've got to have kind of like, it's all going to be driving towards this like big climactic scene and they had to pick what those were for each each of the three movies and have a clear mm-hmm. like ending point even though it was continuing on but um but yeah and even just in terms of the plot details of taking them to Asgiliath yeah. right I was going to call out like what the heck like Frodo almost gives the ring to a Nazgul they, not only does he take them to Asgiliath but then Frodo like is sitting there giving the ring to the flying Nazgul and Asgiliath and you're just like so what about the secrecy? Like, now Sauron knows, right? right? Or he should know, unless the Nazgul right. just don't talk to him. But I'm like, what in the world? Yeah, I, I had that scene on my list, too, and it, I realized, well, this this is just a continuation because the, the hobbits never went to Osgiliath, and Faramir mm-hmm. didn't drag him along and he let him go, so it's just a, a continuation of, of 
an issue <laughs> that I had with the movie. Well, right? but, it, it definitely is a continuation, and I, and I would, but it's like even if I think the Asgillia thing would have been more excusable. I still would have, it still would have been a big issue for me, but the Asgillia thing would have been more excusable if I think that hadn't happened because it's just like, he's sitting there giving the ring to him and, you know. Well, like, now, did somebody shot the Nazgul though, right? And I don't it remember. Was far, okay, <clears throat> okay, so he did do something good. But, no. yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't remember if it killed the Nazgul or if it just flew away from Frodo. So yeah, no, they would have just. Flew away. So he, yeah, he would have gone back like John said. And, hey, here's the ring. Come back with, you know, the other eight. I know who has the ring. Yeah, yeah. Now you a plot hole. Well, I guess you could say that they don't know that Frodo and Sam then that the Nazgul doesn't know this little guy who was handing him the ring then went to Mordor. He probably thinks he went back to Gondor, which is no. what Sauron. With the, but the, uh, the but you have the scene with the Palantir and Pippin, mm. and so. You would assume that if the Nazgul reported back to Sauron, there is a hobbit in Osgiliath who has your ring, there is no reason for him to assume that Pippin in Edoras has it. Which is something I've never thought about until right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's a little bit of a... Yeah. That causes some problems. Um, just the whole Faramir and taking them to Osgiliath part. Yeah. Um, just not the way... Not the way it was done. Um, yeah. Major issues with that. Yeah, so, so no, I agree. Good so question. I have a question because I did not see the extended edition. Um, so there is a scene in the extended edition with uh, Barmir uh, rallying all the troops in Osgiliath and Denethor comes in. Am I to assume that that scene happens right when Frodo and Sam are brought to uh, the Forbidden Pool, right before Faramir starts interrogating them? Because there's a quick shot right at the beginning where Faramir has the horn of Gondor, and it's split. But so, then it goes mm, to the flashback scene. Yeah, so they do the uh, flashback. I'm trying to think when that one works into the film. Um, I, I think that's right when they meet the hobbits, because um, you know, because they have news of what happened to Boromir, right? You know, Faramir found the that's right the horn of Gondor. And I, I think that there, that's like a flashback backstory for us to, to introduce Faramir to us as Boromir's brother. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't recall honestly. But um, that was that was where um, uh, Faramir, I think, was was stationed at, at uh, on the east side of the Anduin, right? And he lost it, and then Boromir had to go retake it, take the ground back. And I think they were using that to show. You know, to establish a ranking, you know, Boromir's better. Mm. Fair. Well, I, yeah. So I had a lot of problems with that extended scene. It's one of those scenes that I'm really happy, and I apologize if there's no some background. <laughs> um, it's one of those scenes that I'm really happy wasn't in the theatrical. Yeah. Um, because mm-hmm. I have, I have problems with actually how all three of those characters are portrayed. Um, mm. Denethor, I, I have a lot of sympathy for them, uh, for Denethor when you read them. Uh, because he's a character who's lost all sense of hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you read a lot of his story in Return of the King, it's, it's incredibly compelling and you, you understand how he's, uh, progressively going insane, uh, off of despair and all that. But I, I found the, the his neglect of Barmir to just be so petty. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and then in contrast, you have Barmir who, he acts as if he's aware of it. And he's reluctant to do things for his father or this, that, but then that part doesn't seem like Boromir to me. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, which isn't to say that I think Barmir would join in on his neglect of his brother, but, um, Barmir in the books and even Barmir, at least in fellowship, uh, he's ready to charge ahead. You know, if something needs to be done for the city, I will go. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, you know, he, he seems annoyed at his father and it's like, mm-hmm. it seems very out of character for Boromir. Yeah. Um, the same thing with like Denethor's disdain for the elves and things, you know, like that just seems like a random mm-hmm. comment, which, uh, is fulfilled in Return of the King where, you know, he tells Gandalf, I, I know more than you think I know because mm-hmm. I've been seeing more. Mm-hmm. Um, but that whole scene seemed to be just all over the place. Like I did not like it. 
Yeah, that's a yeah. that's a very questionable scene, no doubt. Like it's just and and like the whole I don't know, it'd be interesting to get when we get to Denethor and Return of the King and talk about talk about his character because he has a very interesting character. Um but you know, I feel like even with him, you know, this in the books, it's a much it's a subtle if there's disappointment with if any disappointment with Faramir is like a you know, I don't think there's really that many fathers out there who when you know there's issues between them and their kids it's like you know explicitly like i am disappointed in you like and let me remind you again i'm disappointed in you and let me remind yeah. you again like there's nothing you can do to please me like it's always subtle it's always like little things you know mm-hmm. that that happen and um then then denethor i mean it's just like it's like you are the worst father ever <laughs> like and, you're, you're not even trying you're actively trying to like make yeah. your son feel like you know garbage and in the books, I feel like he might have always had favoritism for Boromir, mm-hmm. but it's really after the recent events, probably starting just before the the novel begins, mm-hmm. where he really starts to uh, uh, have this self doubt and self loathing, and then uh, he projects that onto Faramir. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, you know Faramir and the I mean yes, Faramir in the books is entirely different, but Faramir is not his brother at all you know right. his right. brother is the captain of the guard and x y and z um he's the warrior and Faramir is the scholar and you know he he doesn't seem to uh he doesn't fully disregard that in the books but he doesn't accept it you know he he seems to feel that they're my two sons they should be equal and they should be equal towards the greater length and if the greater length is Faramir, then you know because yeah he does have like these snide comments in the book but Good lord, and <laughs> just in the, which is which. By the way, in the film, you know, he says this line. He's like, "Oh, for Captain Farmer to prove his worth." Farmer repeats that later on in the film mm-hmm. when he sees the ring, and I think if if for nothing else, the scene is is good because it shows you Farmer's personal struggle. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I think in the film, it's there's a lot of problems with Farmer, but I think it's just that he doesn't want to sink to certain levels and he feels that he has to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, he gains some self-respect by the end of it, you know, and, and he shows himself that he doesn't need to. Um, but then that phrase gets repeated by Sam, you know, you've shown your worth, Captain mm-hmm. Faramir, uh, which is also an extended scene. Mm-hmm. And I like that scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, the conversation between, I feel like between Faramir and the Hobbits, when when he, you know, finally decides to let them go, you know, I feel like that all happens because Sam isn't. Sam is pretty skeptical of Faramir even in the book, and eventually he realizes they have that little dialogue where you know Sam says, you know, you've shown basically the same effect. You've shown your worth, Captain Faramir, and Captain Faramir says, you know, that's high compliment coming from you know someone who I have such respect for, you know, basically in return. So. Um, yeah, you know, that, that certainly happens, but it's, uh, you know, it's just the valley that Faramir has to go through in terms of, seem, you know, the lack of virtue, it seems, or the, you yeah. know, the, the inner demons and everything that just don't, mm-hmm. that aren't there in the book, you know? Right, um, right. So, you know, I, I almost wonder, you know, it'd be interesting to ask Peter Jackson if there's any, if, if, if he wishes he had any mulligans, if he had, wishes he had any do-overs on these films. And uh, I wonder, I just have to think that, you know, after probably all the criticism he's gotten for that, like, he'd want to say, like, I'd probably do that. I'd probably do Faramir <laughs> and his portrayal over again. I, I think the does, issue is... Does Peter Jackson... Know, works. It, it works within... Sorry, I'm sorry, Will. Um, it works oh, within the film. Yeah. Um, which it, is, it does, yeah. It, it, that's that's sort of what you, you know, uh, when you're people like us who are invested in different adaptations of one story, uh, you have to be aware that things are... You know, they have certain liberties depending on their medium. And so uh, I feel this way about the whole trilogy, but it works. You know, there are parts that we wish that we had. You know, uh, the <laughs> the most boring chapters in Fellowship of the Ring. I'm sure John wants those back because he mm. gets Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil, oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there's several parts. Uh, there's several little scenes in The Two Towers that we want back and... Uh, Virtually the whole last book of Return of the King, I'm sure we would have loved at least some adaptation of those things instead of uh, us having this time skip. 
mm-hmm. but it works in the confines of its universe. And mm-hmm. uh, so having farm your be a bit more suspicious and aggressive. It works in the story that we're given uh, in film form. Yes, it, uh, it's strongly con- uh, contrast how we have him in the books, and uh, you know I'm sure people have their different preferences. But uh, I, I feel, I, yeah. Josh, I, I, I feel like uh, I feel like you're really talking to us about midi chlorians here. <laughs> no, 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 and I am perfectly fine with them. But that's a different conversation. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. That's the uh, that's the Star Wars thing that uh, they did in the prequels. That oh. is like a, a important like meta thing about the universe that lots of Star Wars fans were like, "What in the world is that all about?" But anyway, okay. that's we won't we won't get. Into I would that be right content now. just to laugh and pretend I knew what you were talking about. That's okay. Well, I know better. I know better. Um, I think Will wanted to say. Will, yeah, go ahead, Will. Say yeah. Something? Oh. I well, so I I was trying to figure out maybe why Peter Jackson portrayed Faramir the way he did, and, and the differences between the mediums of them trying to tell us the story. And I, you know, I think he was he maybe beat us over the head with how much more inferior Faramir was to Boromir. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if that is necessarily a a fault of him as a director or uh, maybe it's a fault of us as an audience that um, maybe he doesn't think we'll pick up on that subtlety so mm-hmm. he, you know he's forced to to give us such a an obvious dichotomy between the two brothers hmm. and then the more I thought about that I thought maybe Peter Jackson just has an older brother that <laughs> some of his issues uh- <laughs> some of his Maybe he's got some dad issues too. <laughs> I'm a, I, I have I have a Wikipedia page pulled up for the movie, so I'm gonna click on him and see if he has any. If he has and, a, uh, let's see here. What is his relationship with his father like? He's a child. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's see. It was raised near his parents. Uh, both immigrants yeah. from England. Bill Jackson, veteran. Uh, I don't see anything about brother. I mean, I don't see anything either. They might not. They just include maybe you know, they, that might not have made the Wikipedia page for whatever reason. Yeah. Maybe Jackson didn't want his older brother mentioned. Yeah. Anyway, as a as a younger brother, he doesn't want to give his older brother anything. Yes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, let's see here. Some other. Uh, so got to bring up um, Theoden's possession. Um, not not possessed in the book. Not not possessed by Saruman in the book and uh you know <laughs> I, I feel like Go ahead, I feel Josh. like John's about to say something that would be like no no it's gonna be the Balrog with wings again <laughs> no. Ah. no we already covered that we you know we'll leave let bygones be bygones the Balrog is what it is but um Theoden's possession um and the you know it, the way Theoden is initially handled in the film is uh is pretty far off pretty far off the mark I feel like, and again, there might be reasons for Jackson doing that, but uh, in the book, Theoden is, he's just, he's kind of given into a despair about his situation as, uh, you know, in, in large part because he's under the influence of Grima Wormtongue. And it's not necessarily that there's not some, you know, kind of spooky, more magical stuff going on, but, you know, just the whole thing of him, like, just being like a lump of old flesh, just sitting there mumbling. Like that's not how it's overdone. It's overdone. Like it's it. That's not how he is in the book. He's just he he's he has he's he's closed in. He's cornered. He's under the influence of a guy who is really not his ally Mm -hmm. and who's betraying him behind Mm -hmm. his back. Um, But he thinks is his only is the only person he can trust. Right. And um, and you know he's just and he 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 doesn't think he can trust Gandalf. You know. Um, Whereas in the movie he's possessed by he's literally possessed by Saruman you know yeah not not a fan of the way that all worked out I so I think this comes back to uh how uh how Professor Tolkien wrote his novels where there's a lot of subtlety in magic and mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. the magic is in words it's not in how it's described and how it's illustrated um and it's funny because I know having having watched some of the featurettes for the Hollywood films that Peter Jackson also doesn't like magic. He doesn't like showing magic. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think in this case, this was something that you can read it and understand what's going on from a psychological point of view 
but you you do need a physical representation. And yeah, it might have been a little bit extreme mm-hmm. uh, having him look like he just came out of Tales of the Crypt, but uh, I think it, 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 you know, it's the representation that worked. You know, it's it, it's very different when you have the scene with Saruman rallying the wild men because you know Saruman's power is in his voice and his words, and so you don't need, you know, you don't need to see, like, sound waves going over people, you know, uh, starry-eyed, and, you know, being convinced. It, mm-hmm. it works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, if you just had the scene where he's talking and uh, it just becomes a debate where Grimm Warm telling is just ousted, it almost makes you think, well, what was the point in him being there to begin with? Um, mm-hmm. If this was going to be such a simple task, mm-hmm. uh, you might think, sure, you needed Gandalf to sort of get him out of this rut, but why couldn't someone else do it? You mm-hmm. know, um, did it have to be a wizard? And then in that case, mm-hmm. what on top of being a wizard makes Gandalf so special? You make some yeah. good points, Josh. Yeah, I mean, no, I, know, I, I, yeah, I agree. And, and um, I think, you know, I, and I, I guess, I, I do think that it's, I do think that it's still a little bit overdone. I can see the point you make. I, I can see the point that, you know, there's got to be, in making a film adaptation of this book, there has to be a visual cue that is a little more easily, you know, maybe a little bit more easily recognizable. And, you know, and Jackson had to walk the fine line between I'm I'm making a movie that needs to be a blockbuster, you know, that has high expectations, and, you know, there needs to be a popcorn film element to this Mm-hmm. to this movie um and you know he, and and trying to make a movie that was still faithful to this amazing literary literary work um i think i think at the end of the day you know i think the tales the tales of the crypt aspect of his appearance probably was i, I would still maintain was overdone but um but i could see that there needs to be you know i think theoden still could have spoken more for himself you know and in a lot mm-hmm. of the things there, because in the book there's grima speaks and then theoden will speak and, and obvi- it's obvious it's obvious that he's very heavily under the influence of Grima of Wormtongue, but Theoden is still speaking directly to Gandalf frequently. He's not just kind of hun- hunched over, mumbling, you know, with his mm-hmm. like glazed over look in his eyes. Um, so uh, you know, however that may have manifested differently visually, I don't know, but you know, that's yeah. that's my criticism there. Yeah, I do. I will say I did, I actually liked the. Um I liked the way they portrayed his transformation. Mm. And maybe that's because the first, you know, his uh, his possession. Are you talking about, was, like, when, when Gandalf thrusts uh, Yeah, Saruman and he, out like, kind of, it's almost, you know, he comes back to life. Oh, the, mu- the movie magic, yeah. When he, that's what I said. That yeah. It's funny, Josh, that you used the word magic. Because when, when we were watching that scene, when Theoden, you know, like, the color comes back to his face and he begins to look human again. I looked at John and I was like, it's movie magic. Like, it totally, you know, I just, I I really did like that. And I think part of it, too, and I, I will agree with you, I think it was probably overdone. But I think a lot of that is, like you said, with the blockbuster film aspect, Jackson can't assume, and he, he you know, rightly so, that everyone that's going to watch this movie has read the books. Mm-hmm. Right? So I think in certain things, you need to almost overdo them to make the point so that people understand that haven't, don't have the background, understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes extremes portray that a little bit better true true and you know jackson is the one who's at this point has won the academy yes. award for all this and yes. i'm not but uh right no <laughs> um, i understand what you're so saying many. yeah i'm just yeah yeah, yeah for, for for the return of the king not for this one but they got nominated for a bunch for this all one. 11 films but basically one basically oh. return of the king was the one that they were awarding him for all three for of the films right. um, yeah. but uh and, and it is a huge achievement but uh it, you know Again, not, it doesn't ruin the movie or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's just something that's like could have been not not my favorite thing. Well, yeah. let, me, let me turn to Will um, or or Josh. Y'all want to or Greta? Do you want to offer another bad thing? Maybe I want to hear from Will. Will. We haven't heard from Will in a few minutes. Yeah, Will, are you still there? All right. Oh yeah, I'm here. Good. So, um, so I, I don't have anything epic that was a dislike, but um, and, and maybe it's more of a conversation. To ask you guys. Um, so, so let me do the quick one first. One was there's what I'm calling the Olympic torch orc in the Helm's Deep battle. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, I, I was not a fan of that. <laughs> yeah, so if you you might need to watch it if you don't know what we're talking about. But to me, it just stood out. It's such a stark 
contrast to the rest of the movie. And and there's a scene earlier where um, Grima leans over the um, the gunpowder or whatever it is that Saruman is making with like this, this tiniest candle, and Saruman pushes him back like he's gonna blow up, you know, the whole tower. And then they need this like armored orc with a road flare to run in and set the bomb off. Right. You know, it just it it was really incongruent, and I just it felt really out of place. But um, I'm trying to remember. It's the part where the they set the bombs underneath the um, underneath the uh, the wall, the, the long wall at Helm's Deep. Uh-huh. The the orcs set like those big mi- They're real, I guess they're mines or whatever, but like. Um, they're basically these big spike balls, and they put them up there so that they can blow up the oh, wall. Oh, yeah, 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 they're like, yeah. that's the one weakness of Helm's Deep. Right, yeah. And they put these things there, and then they, and then the guy comes up to light them. The orc comes oh. running up, and it's like slow motion, and that's oh, why... Oh, I remember that. You know, that's that. why he refers yeah. to it as the Olympic scene. The Olympic so. scene, and, yeah. yeah. And he ran by a lot of orcs with regular fire. <laughs> they were much closer, so it was oh. sort of like, here I am, shoot, shoot me, archers. Yes, you know? I, yeah. So, but I, I wanted to ask you guys about the... Um, All right, sorry. Uh, Musical interlude there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Ao, I'm trying to remember the name. Aomer's sister, I think, is Aowen. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now, there was... I don't remember a romance between her and Aragorn in the books. Is that... Was that added for the movie, or did I just miss it? No, in the movie, it's, it's heavily implied yeah. that she has romantic feelings for him. Mm-hmm. And but, he uh, he shows no response. You know, he doesn't reciprocate those feelings at all. Mm-hmm. Um, even but I don't her, remember her as a character even in the book. Is was she? Oh, is she a made for yeah. movie character? Yes, yes she's no, in the she book. Was. No, she's in the book. Yeah. She, she's definitely in the book. And there is there is some there is some kind of degree of uh, like I think I think it, she definitely looks at Aragorn and says, you know. Wow, like in the book, I think there's a sense that like, wow, he's a hunk, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, <laughs> kind of, right? Yeah, which but, maybe, yes. maybe isn't the best way to put it, but like, you know, just just like a wow, like an admiration for right. this I was great man, respect. you know. That's kind. Of, I kind of read it was I think she thought a lot of Aragorn. Yeah. I think she had a lot of respect and appreciation for mm-hmm. what he was bringing to her, you know, her people. Yeah, but I didn't. I think that was a little exaggerated in the movie, just for the sake. I, of... I I think it. Okay, I think it was very over dramatic in certain scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think overall it worked, but you know, mm-hmm. there uh, there's some random like right before the wargs attack and Eowyn turns around and she looks at Aragorn and you know he's majestically getting on top of the horse and going, right. well, you know, it's yeah, it's a little much, yeah, um, a little cheesy, and, and it it weakened it to me. I think it weakens her a little bit mm-hmm. because she's. In the books, and I think she's in the so films strong, as well, but, yeah. she's probably the strongest female character mm-hmm. that we have. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and she's, at least in the book, she's the only female character that we have a lot of story for within the Lord of the Rings, because because mm-hmm. uh, Arwen's a Arwen's a prize mm-hmm. um, for mm-hmm. nonsense purposes. You know, her her character is uh, greatly exaggerated in the films, and I think it works in the films. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's it's not to the same effect. Two very different type of women. Um, yes. And when you're when you're reading it and when you're watching it, it's sort of uh, it, you yourself are are deciding which is the, the better choice—the one he's destined to be with, or um, or Eowyn. And you know, you have these two. They're they're both royalty. They're both uh, beautiful, strong, independent. And the only difference is. One of them is divine, and the other mm-hmm. is not. And, right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's sort of like um, it's not the same, uh, but it's sort of like in the books where uh, Gimli and Eomer have this uh, have their discussions on Galadriel, and Eomer in Return of the King, and I know I'm jumping way ahead. Um, he says that Arwen is the most beautiful woman he's ever seen, mm-hmm. and so Gimli's like. All right, we have no more issues, you know. Uh, I think the words he says is, uh, you appreciate the moon while I appreciate the sun, mm. Uh, mm. which is relevant to uh, Arwen and Galadriel's mm-hmm. hair. Sure, um, sure, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's sort of like that, and especially when you think about uh, Eowyn is a woman, 
uh, and men as a as a whole race, men rose with the sun. You know, it's sort of like that similar uh, dichotomy. And R wins the moon, and R, you know, all these different things. Um, but yeah, I think in the film, it's just there are scenes where it's a little bit much. Yeah, no, I agree. Works. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I feel I'm trying to find. I don't have it well marked, unfortunately, but I feel like there's a scene in particular in the book that there's a little bit like there's a dialogue between Aragorn and Eowyn mm-hmm. um, that uh, you know that might be helpful in this discussion, but uh, I can't find it, unfortunately. I don't want to. But you know, figure. they needed they needed some romantic element to get the chicks interested. So. <laughs> You know, I mean, or to keep them interested, and they need to, you know, I mean, I didn't really have a problem with it. It was just a little, um, you know, I think they maybe added a softer yeah. element. Same thing with Arwen, well, you know, coming it, to Aragorn. And it adds an element of conflict, right, because... Um, right, it's like it creates a Ar- love triangle. Right, yeah. you know, there's Ar- mm-hmm. Aragorn is obviously, you know, that he and Arwen have already pledged pledge their troth to one another mm-hmm. and um and she's having her whole thing of like am i going to go to the am i going to go to the gray havens and leave right. or am i going to stay here, stay here and you know choose choose a mortal life with right. aragorn which i thought was interesting too and we might want to wait to talk about this but just i noted but the Ar- the arwen and aragorn scenes mm-hmm. and especially when elrond comes in and is talking to arwen about you know trying to convince her to go to valinor and she's like oh but i love man it kind of made me. It made me think of Baron and Luthien. Like I, I wonder if that was kind of a. Well, yeah, I mean, ref, you know, because there was obviously Aragorn is like Luthien, you know, and whereas Arwen is going to need to is being forced to choose between, you know, yeah. her divine nature and human. Well, at one at some point we're going to read the, uh, you know, there's all these appendices at the end of Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. and we're going to read the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, which is a separate. A separate little oh, devoted okay. Uh, okay. story in there. I, you know, I don't think I've ever actually sat down and read it. Um, hmm. So, and I, and I was as I was watching the movie, I was like, you know, I don't really feel capable of commenting on how this is portrayed in the movie uh, right now because it's fair game. Like if it's in the tale of Aragorn and Arwen mm-hmm. from the appendix, mm-hmm. and I don't know that well enough mm-hmm. to to make any useful commentary <laughs> gotcha. on it. So, gotcha. Um, yeah, the only thing I will say about that is that Aragorn definitely doesn't fall off a cliff in the middle of a battle on the way to Helm's Deep in the uh, book. So, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but, you know, again, so a little something added in there. I mean, I, you know. But I he needed to fall in order to bring Arwen in. I, I guess, yeah, I think that's probably yeah. probably some truth. Although with Eowyn and Aragorn, you know, having some flashbacks in there, you know, to Aragorn's... Um, you know, to Aragorn's love for Arwen. Right, you know. with the, Arwen's asking about the metal, yes. the, the pendant that he's wearing. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to me that she, she, uh, she, I don't know if this is in the book or not, but Eowyn actually asks Arwen, where is she? Mm-hmm. And he's like, who? And she's like, the woman that gave you that mm-hmm. necklace or whatever. And I was like, how did, like, how would she know? That a woman gave that. I don't know. I just struck me. She's a very perceptive. Who else would? Have, how else would he have that? I mean, you think about it though. Like you know, especially back then. Like, would a you know guy have been just wearing something like something as beautiful as like a, a yeah, man? Yeah, I guess that's you know, true. Maybe an elf, maybe maybe an elf would have, but a man like what's that? <laughs> Could have been dwarf maid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Could have been an ant wife. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was weird too, Greta. I, okay. I, I thought that was presumptuous of of her, but um, you know, I guess the, he's a pretty scruffy guy to have such a pretty. Necklace. Yeah, to have such a pretty. Yes, <laughs> yeah. This was before the ages of man bling and stuff like that. I guess before all the. Yeah. Yeah, where guys started wearing that kind of thing more regularly. Mm-hmm. But and it was beautiful. Like I, it was you know, and obviously it probably looked otherworldly to mm-hmm. anyone. Like it look, it had an elvish. Oh yeah. Quality That's, yeah. to it. So. Yeah, I don't think it's completely out of place for her to ask about that. I mean, I think that's well, just that she assumed it was a woman. I guess that's just kind of what that that kind of made me wonder. But mm-hmm. she's probably just more perceptive than I am. Well, yeah, and maybe you know, maybe it's to show her own yeah a degree of her perceptiveness and like mm-hmm. she's you know she's not she's you know that's one of the things about Aon is like she's she's a uh, she's direct and she and there's yeah. a there's a, a fierceness. To her, mm-hmm. you know, she's not. There is. She's not a delicate flower. She is a. Right. Uh, she wants. She wants to be. 
she wants to be in the midst of things, in the thick of things. Right. Um, and so the details, the, way to, like, the ways to show that. And yeah, I guess that's true. But I do think, I feel like she could have portrayed, been portrayed a little bit stronger. Like, there's only, there's, I really feel like well, when we got that one, what? I was just going to say, wait till we get to return. Yeah, to I know what I was going to say. I feel like we, because I feel like in the book, she comes across as this very strong female leadership warrior, like brave type, mm-hmm. you know? But I feel like in the book, we really only get that one kind of glimpse where she's like arguing with Theoden about how, or Aragorn, she says something to him about, they want me to stay in the caves. I want to go fight with you guys. You know, I feel like that's really the only kind of, you know, mm-hmm. anyway. I want her to be stronger, but yeah. like you said, I guess I'll just have to wait for. Well, she's a—I mean, she's an important character, you know. It's, it's, she's one of those she that, yeah. You know, um, you know, she may she may be one of the better. She's not quite one of the major characters throughout the entire book, but she's like one of the major minor characters, and uh, you know, it's, and she's mm-hmm. a she's pretty beloved, you know, as mm-hmm. far as I think the major minor characters go. Yeah. So she's an important one to get right. She's almost like Faramir in a way, you know, in that way. So, yes. Yeah. Um. Well, what did you guys think about the Ents overall? Oh, um, who wants to go first, Josh? <laughs> um, no, please talk. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so one thing I, I thought the Sorry. book they mentioned that Treebeard is older than Gandalf. I know we talked about Gandalf's age, but is that right, John? Uh, I'm sorry. What, say Treebeard that again. Uh, Tree Treebeard is older than Gandalf, I believe. Not sure if it talks about that in the book or not. I think it talks about that he knows Gandalf and Saruman from ages ages back um, from time immemorial but I'm not sure if they compare ages of the two well I think okay. isn't isn't Fangorn the first being to be he's the first being outside of Tom Bombadil in Middle Earth I recall because yeah, isn't, and I, I isn't he's a Maiar of Yavanna <laughs> I'm getting my uh, I'm getting my Valar oh if, if Fon, I don't think Fangorn is a um Tree, Treebeard Fongorn is a um, uh, is a Maiar. I think I, I think the Ents. I think what they they mentioned briefly in the film about the Ents being awoken by the Elves and taught mm-hmm. taught to speak and that kind of thing. I think that's I'm fairly certain that's in the book. Well, um, in, okay. Because in in Silmarillion, they are they are the direct contrast of the Dwarves. Yeah, it's true. I, I, Aule I, creates the doors, and Yavanna creates the ends, mm-hmm. and she says, "Our two children will never mix." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I believe that Fangorn mentions that he's one of the he is one of, if not the earliest being in Middle Earth, and he's seen the forest recede back to you know where it is now, and the old forest by the Shire is a remnant of what was, hence why there's certain beings there. Well, it definitely, you know, you're, you're absolutely right about that. The ants aren't mentioned in, cha- in chapter two of the Silmarillion with Ali and Yvanna, and you know, the ants are like her response to Ali's dwarves. But of course, the dwarves and the ants don't, the dwarves at least we know don't necessarily awaken for some time until after the children of Iluvatar, um, at least after the firstborn, the elves, because that's one of Iluvatar's specific things is I won't let them come before the elves, right? My firstborn. Um, uh, and I think so. I think probably maybe maybe you can imply that the same thing would be said of Yavanna and her her sub creations. You know, when it comes to um, uh, you know the being being a being kind of the opposite of the dwarves in that way. But that's I'm glad you brought that up. Just remembering that in the um, uh, you know when Gimli walks into the forest with his axe and everything, and he's like Aragorn's like put yeah. your axe. <laughs> um, that's that's funny to remember that because you know of that pitting that they they were really two like polar opposite creations sub creations of the Valar Ali creates the dwarves Yavanna creates mm-hmm. the ends in response mm-hmm. yeah um, well and I just wanted to ask while I while I was able to talk to both of you guys because you're such experts on it but the um the the thing that I really didn't like about the ants was um when they're walking through the forest and uh, they're talking about the ant wives, and um, I think it's Mary and Pippin are asking Treebeard about the ant wives, and Treebeard's like, "Oh, we forgot them," and it's like, "Why, why, why even put them in and mention them if you're going to just say, oh, we forgot them?" And they, you know, because they they would go out and look for them, and they they're they're very much aware of of the ant wives still, mm-hmm. but um, 
it was a, it was another one of those odd choices where it was almost like a throwaway line of dialogue in the movie. So I thought, well, if you're gonna include them, why kind of betray the the book <laughs> if you're gonna put them in? Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, is he referring? So, he's referring to he forgets what they look like. I think he yeah, forgets what they look like, and I think he says that we lost them. Yeah. That's what he says. We lost them. Then he asks Mary and Pippin, have you seen them in, in the Shire? And they're yeah. like, yeah, I don't think so. But yeah, they forget what, do what they, they look, look like. What do they look like? And yeah. he's like, I've forgotten. And yeah. Because it's been, I think it's been so long. I feel like that's in the book, isn't it? it I think, well, it's, it's definitely condensed in the movie. Yeah. I, well, no, I, no, no doubt. No, no doubt. There's a, there's a poem in the book about. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Him. I was hoping that they were going to include that. Well, I think they included little bits, little bits of it. Oh, right? did they? Yeah. He, he's kind of singing to them. Like in that scene, he's kind of. Treebeard's like singing. Oh, and, um, is that what he's singing about? And he's, I think it's little snippets of that. Oh, poem. okay. Okay. Yeah. I didn't pick okay. up on that. I th- you know, I thought, I mean, you're not going to do a big scene on the Entwives in the movie because there's, it's, they don't really it's, a, it's a very, yeah. it's definitely not popcorn, you know, popcorn fare, but, um, sure. Yeah. But like, I thought, I actually, I actually kind of appreciated the way that they handled that, um, you know, in, at least referring to it, uh, in a, in a passing reference mm-hmm. as they're traveling, you know. That, Mm-hmm. Uh, these ant wives are a real thing, and you know, this, and and just kind of that longing, um, which I think captures well what it is in the book. It would have been, it would have been extremely cheesy for like there to be a reunion of Treebeard and ant wives at the end of a mo- <laughs> at the end of one of these movies or something like that. Yeah. Like, oh, the happy ending. Like, no, that's, yeah. you know. So at least Jackson, it's true. I, 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 it's, I like, yeah. I kind of like the way he handled that. But yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I I felt like, I felt like the ants overall were 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 okay. I felt like the, um, I felt like he. I felt like they were a little too humorized, if you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like in the book, kind of like it's it's to a lesser degree what happens to Faramir, but like, um, the Ents are in in the book, the Ents are funny, but not because they're written funny, but because they're just they're odd. They're so odd compared to our reality, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, here they are, these talking trees that have existed forever, and. Uh, and the factors of, of a society that would be like that are funny because it's so different from the way human society is. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if we can relate a lot more to Hobbit society or to Gondorian society or even to Elvish society than we mm-hmm. can to the society of, uh, you know, Ents, to like a culture of Ents. Yeah. And I feel like that in the book, they're a little bit... Treebeard is maybe a little bit too much of a... Um, He's a little. He almost feels a little dim-witted, rather than just slow as as a as, mm. a, as an ant would. You know, and I don't even like the word slow. Like, well, I don't the, know, the just, time scale that they they experience time on such a different yes. scale. Yeah, mm-hmm. than we do. That's that's what makes them interesting. But mm-hmm. yeah, it does. They they that comes across as like a an inability to grasp the present, <laughs> which I think makes them look kind of dumb. And mm. I I don't I, I didn't I didn't care for that portrayal either. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I um, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't like that, and, and I read some why, why Jackson did this, but, you know, in the book, Treebeard, they, after they have their ant moot, they're like, okay, we're going, time to go fight. They right? didn't actually decide. I, I mean, they're, they're like, it's was... time to go fight. Like, in the book, they're like, after they have their... Oh, interview, yeah, in the book. Yeah, I mean, the movie, that was a little... Yeah, they, they said, oh, we're not going to go fight. It's not a problem. Right, exactly. And then, and then Mary and Pippin have to come to the rescue to get them to go see what he's done so they know it's their problem. Right. But in the book, like, that's not in the book. And, right. Um, uh, so, you know, again, like, I feel like that takes Treebeard from the way Tolkien wrote him down a notch a little bit. You know, he's mm-hmm. um, he's not quite... It's kind of like what happened with Faramir, right? He's not quite the same character right, that right. he is in the books. It, yes. It's it's not as it's not as uh, egregious a distortion as I feel like it is with Faramir, but it's it's still a problem. I mm-hmm. feel like, um, mm-hmm. and I think the reason Jackson or his fellow writers said they did that was because it it makes Merry and Pippin uh, they felt like they were luggage otherwise. You know, they want to give them more of a purpose. They want to give them more of a purpose and all that in in this mm-hmm. film. Um, I will say though, I thought Treebeard, I, I, Treebeard, Treebeard, um, I did 
I understand like their little quibbles with him, but I really I liked the way he was done. Mm-hmm. Like I thought he was very. I, I think like, the visual is pretty cool. Yeah, the visual yeah. is really good, and I just felt like he was besides the whole thing about deciding not to go to Isengard in the first place. Um, I feel like he's portrayed as very lovable and endearing. Mm-hmm. Like you just kind of I wanted to hug him. Yeah, um, I like I, the light of the eyes because yeah. that's something that's very important to yes. Tolkien in the books is the light of the yes. man's eyes. Oh, yes, exactly. Um, so visually, I thought they were really good, and just personality wise, I thought. You know, he's a lot like I would have. Well, I felt a, I felt the same about him in the movie as I did. Before. Yeah, yeah, but I want to know what Josh thinks. Um, so for me, um, I say my favorite scene in that film is when the end start making their way towards Isengard after mm-hmm. seeing part of Fangorn. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. but Very just cool. going back to some of the things you guys were saying, um, yeah, yes, I. I'm a bit disgruntled by the fact that the Ents seem to uh, have a slower mental processing. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's interesting when you when you read these type of characters in fantasy and in fiction that um, they do experience time differently. You know, uh, like I've read the whole Percy Jackson series, and there are tree spirits who, uh, you know, they fall asleep for years. Why? Because they're trees, and trees can grow for years on end, and so. Uh, when another character is taking a nap for a month, you know, they're wondering why they weren't woken up. Well, a nap for a month is like five minutes for a tree. You know, what, is, what does this matter? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's a little, it's a little, you know, it doesn't really do the ends justice to have them be so slow processing. Uh, visually, I think they look great because I don't know how else to do an end mm-hmm. without it look. Because the thing is, you have the Ents and you have the Horns, and the Horns are the ones who are actually trees. Mm-hmm. So, how how do you make an Ent not? How do you make an Ent look less of a tree, without sort of, without making it some sort of like golem figure or something like that? Something that just looks like uh, animated dirt, uh, reanimated dirt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I think though. I'm perfectly okay with how the ants were in the film, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of their ant mood and uh, their uh, indecisiveness to fight or to go to war, and because uh, it's yeah, Jackson wanting to not make Mary and Pippin luggage. Well, he's he did that for most of the film. Well, I stopped there at that point, okay. but um, I I have a lot of issues. Like if there's if there's a reason why some of the things from the novel Return of the King didn't happen, it's because, you know, Aragorn fell off a cliff and he spent 50 minutes walking back or, you know, you had all these little things with Merry and Pippin going on. They wanted to get stuck in Old Man Willow. Why that was even there is beyond me. <laughs> um, but I was I was OK with it because it's you're forcing the realization on certain characters that there is a need to. Uh, strike back at injustice, and it's a, yeah. you know it's a mm-hmm. great scene when it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and my why I like them refusing and then being thrusted into the battle is the same reason why I dislike uh, the elves coming to help out at Helm's Deep mm-hmm. because in the novel that doesn't happen, yeah. mm-hmm. which is not it's not one of those oh it doesn't happen in the books, but uh, for me it lessens the significance of men fighting orcs alone mm. and this is you know you're you're uh, professor Tolkien's leading up to this age of men where men are going to rule and if you have the elves come in you know he's he's trying yeah, that's uh, a good point yeah but like P- <laughs> pj was trying to bring back the uh the old alliance which is great but you already have that because the mm-hmm. fellowship, whether they are together or not, they represent all of the major races mm-hmm. throughout mm-hmm. Middle Earth. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you include the ends into that, sure, that's like you're getting to find a little touches in there. You know, uh, these guys are going to be important in their own way. Uh, the elves are all important. Why? Because the elves are leaving. You know, they've come to their own realization that their time has ended. They're going to go back. Um, and so it just, I, uh, I love the guy who plays uh, Hadir. I can't remember his name right now. Um, but it just seemed like he killed him for no reason. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, why did he have to? Why did he have to die, Peter? Like, um, yeah. no, I mean, it's, it, it is really, you know, it's sort of like, um, it, it's similar to like uh, Craig Parker. 
Yes. Spartacus. Oh God, he's he's great in Spartacus. Um, it it's it's like the Battle of Thermopylae. If you're aware of that, if you've seen the 300 film, the like 300 ago. film does something that's it's the opposite. In the 300 film, it's just the 300 Spartans. Um, historically, that's not true, and the film does an injustice to history and to mm. the people who fought in that battle because it's not just 300; it's about 5,000 different soldiers from all these different uh Greek city states and all this stuff and you're in the film you're taken away from the fact that men can do this on their yeah, own. Yeah, it's like oh yeah. oh the elves right. are here now, so now now we can feel a little better about the situation and it's yeah. like no, this is they yeah, weren't there. So, mm-hmm. I, I mean, and sure the numbers are far just just ridiculous in the film. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, I mean again, it is like 300 men against 10,000 orcs. And I don't even think in the novel they give you an, an, an estimated number. They just say, there's this massive army. Mm-hmm. Defend it. Mm-hmm. You know, defend against it. And mm-hmm. so I think it, I think it take it, uh, I think it takes away from, uh, the strength of men in that film that you then get in Return of the King. And in Return of the King, it's fantastic, you know, with the Battle of Pelanor and then, uh, the battle at the Black Gate, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the, the um, I, so on the on the note of the ints and the in the final the final scene the march of the ints, um, I love yeah that 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 to me is worth highlighting like the portrayal of the ints storming Isengard and mm-hmm. pulling down um, the dam, mm-hmm. um, the baptism. Yeah, the love. Yeah. I you know I thought that was extremely well done. I love. I love the vari- how they they captured well the variety of the ants and you know each of them kind of representing a certain type of tree. Um, yeah. I thought they did that extremely well in the way they showed they depicted the ants mm-hmm. um, visually. But just that that's a great and awesome scene where they're you know just <laughs> I love seeing Saruman come out like on his tower and looking around like uh oh this was I had not calculated for this <laughs> mm-hmm. you know just the look in his eyes of like utter terror like this this was not supposed to happen. Um, and, you know, seeing that realization in his eyes and that come up it's for him. Um, and the Ents just like going, you know, here they've been kind of these slow, almost like super peaceful creatures this whole movie. And then like all of a sudden they're just like, it's, it's, it's time for vengeance, you know, like ven- vengeance has come upon you. And, mm-hmm. and the way they just, they overrun Isengard yeah. and, no, you know, just great. destroy all the, all the forces. And mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, it's, it's beautifully, it is, beautifully done. That, is, that was very well done. Yeah. Um, and I got one, just one gripe. This is, and this is from, again, the extended scene. Uh, when the orcs are going back over the hill from Helm Steep, they're seeing mm-hmm. you know, they're all running into the forest, and Gandalf mm-hmm. is like, you know, wait, hold up. There's no need to pursue them any further. And you see, uh, you see signs that the orcs are being attacked in Fangorn. Yeah. Forest. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I didn't like that. Uh, I watched that scene separately and, um, I thought for one, there, the beautiful shot of the orc going over the hill and you're looking back at, uh, and you're looking towards Helm's Deep rather and, you know, the light shining. I mean, it's a, it's a transcendent scene. Mm-hmm. And then you're you're taken into Jurassic Park where the trees <laughs> are just moving all over. I mean, that's I wrote that down. I was like, oh, it looks like something out of Jurassic Park. Yeah, um, and it's it, that's one of those things where it seems like they just wanted to make a reference to what happens in the book, mm-hmm. where you know Gandalf does come, and then there are the horns who also like it. The forest, you know, it's that Macbeth moment where the forest is mm-hmm. coming towards you. Yes, yes, um, and it just. It didn't really seem to flow. Like, that's mm. a number of these uh, uh, extended edition scenes I'm happy weren't in the theatrical film because I would have mm-hmm. felt very awkward about them. Um, a lot of the scenes with Aragorn, too, which uh, if we have time to, I'll get to. It's just, I don't I, I don't think that they're necessary. Well, go, go ahead. And, uh, so, because I wanted to move on to the interesting here soon and just kind of do a wrap up on anything else, but go ahead and speak to Aragorn because I did have, I did have some thoughts, some you know, not major disappointments, but some minor disappointments on the way he was portrayed and portrayed in certain things. But um, I didn't write a lot of them down, so go ahead. Um, so I mean, I I I remember you guys spoke about. I remember Greta spoke about this actually. Uh, she was 
uh, she had a really strong opinion on Vigo Mortensen's uh, Aragorn. Yeah, when we did the fellowship review. And, is that what uh, you mean when we did the yeah. fellowship review? Yeah. No, I was, yeah. yes, I did. You're right. Um, Good memory. And, and I agree with that. You know, he's a little bit too moody. He's a little bit too doubtful of his own strength, uh, which is not something you get in the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, my my problem, and this is a problem I have with the two towers. There's not uh, there's not a lot of context for certain things that hmm. go on or things that are said. Um, and just things that are in the theatrical and in all the versions, uh, something like the rope that Gollum's using to, uh, the rope that Sam's using mm-hmm. to hold Gollum, you know, if, uh, there's no reference to that in the theatrical version of Fellowship of the Ring, where Sam gets the rope from, you don't understand, you know, you kind of, it's one of those things that, yeah, of course Gollum would be complaining, you know, he's, he, he's proven himself to be nocturnal, what's gonna happen when he, you know, he thinks, He's gone through tons of mental changes. You know, he thinks he's a goblin, and of course his son's going to hurt him. Uh, The other thing, like you guys mentioned earlier, when Sam falls right by the Black Gate, and as a kid, I never understood, you know, Frodo just, like, pulls his cloak over, Mm. and they're hidden. Yeah. When, you know, you don't know that the cloaks are elf-made, and they're Mm. enchanted, and all this stuff. Unless um, you've read the book, obviously. Yeah, unless you yeah. read the book. Yeah. Uh, there's the glittering caverns at Helm's Deep, which in the film look beautiful, but mm. they actually do hold a certain character significance for the relationship of Gimli and Legolas and how, mm. you know, they say, you know, if if you choose to come with me to Fangorn, I'll come with you to the glittering caves and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. there's a couple scenes in the extended edition that in my opinion, are just unnecessary. Um, one of them is uh, when Saruman and Grima Wormson are talking about the Ring of Bar here, mm. um, and how Grima just comes back from Edoras and he mentions having met this man who, you know, he describes the ring and Saruman being the scholar of ring lore is able to say, oh, so, you know, uh, Gandalf believes he found the heir of Elendil. It, it, it's it's good to have that prior knowledge for when you get to return to the king, but it's not necessary at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it is with Aragorn because there's another scene where, uh, and this is one of those mellow, dramatic, romantic scenes. I'm also happy wasn't there with uh, Eowyn and Aragorn. And Eowyn brings him stew, and you know it's, it's oh, slightly yeah. comedic. He doesn't want to drink the stew because it's right. gross. Oh right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What is that meat in there? I'm not even like. I think they were like, dumplings. Oh, they're not dumplings. dumplings. Okay. Uh, I thought it, it was some like kind dumplings. of meat. I was like, oh, what kind of meat is that? But yeah, it didn't look cooked, right? Yeah, yeah. It, looked, it looked raw. That's why I thought <laughs> it was a dumpling. Yeah. The, the first comment on YouTube that when I watched it was. When a dwarf refuses your cooking, you should probably throw that food out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there's that scene where he reveals to her that he's a descendant of the Numenorians. And they use that term, mm-hmm. or they use the Dunedain, but then they use Numenorians. Right. Because mm-hmm. um, she mentions that she fought with, or that somebody had told her that he had fought with her grandfather or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, she's and like, that's how where is he that reveals possible? her. That's where he reveals his age. His age, right. Um, yeah. but again, that's all, that's all stuff that if you, if you never read the books, you don't know about the history of Numenor and the Numenorians mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the Dune Design. But there is no reference of that either in the Fellowship of the Ring film. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Nor is there a reference of that in, uh, Return of the King. Mm-hmm. So it mm-hmm. seems sort of, uh, it's like PJ wants you to do your own research, mm-hmm. which is fine, but you can do your own research without, you know, being blatantly told these things. Like they were, uh, the Dunedain as a, uh, as an association is repeated at the end of the Battle of Five Armies in The Hobbit, mm-hmm. um, uh, whereas Hrandua tells Legolas, go seek out the Dunedain. Yeah. Who are the Duna die? You know, right? Of right. course, by that point, most people have seen the films. Mm-hmm. They know he's talking specifically about Aragorn. Um, but right. it's it's all these different things. You know, mm-hmm. there's a scene with Gandalf as well, where Gandalf is looking out, and Gandalf says all these things that are in the theatrical version as they're uh, as they're racing towards Edoras, and you know the. Rohan has been poisoned, and you know there's uh, there's an evil that's controlling these lands or whatever. And then he explicitly calls out Aragorn as being the heir of Elendil, which mm-hmm. again 
when he does it in Return of the King is fantastic because it, it's almost like a side comment. You know, it's after Pippin has looked into the Palantir and, you know, he mm-hmm. just gives a glance over at Aragorn and says, Sauron knows that the Earth of Lendo is coming. You know, now he's afraid. It has some significance. In Return of the King, there's less significance in the Two Towers because right. in the film version of the Two Towers, it almost seems like an isolated incident. Like, this is the prelude to war. This is why in the written version... Helm's Deep is not described in such grand detail as the Battle of Pelennor Fields will be described later on and all these things. So it's it seemed a little off for me. Um I you know, again, I'm I'm happy I didn't see the version. I am looking at my notes and all of these are like unnecessary scene, unnecessary scene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you know, That's it, probably it, why they didn't make the theatrical cut, but you know, a lot of them didn't. Yeah, so. I, it really just could be that I I've, I've only ever seen the theatrical film. Mm-hmm. Uh but like the uh, the counting at the end of Helm's Deep between Gimli and Legolas is a hilarious scene. Mm-hmm. It's completely unnecessary, though. <laughs> but I would, if it was there, I would have laughed and I would have been like, "Oh, well, you know." So what? that's not that's... the theatrical version. No. No, well, they they count at different times in the theatrical version, but that scene where he like, uh, oh, it's the he one could, extra. He line. said he was squirming. Yeah. You know, he was, he was squirming because he was twitching because my axe was in him. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a hilarious scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like. Again, it's funny in Return of the King where, you know, uh, Legolas brings down the Oliphant and then Gimli's like, that still only counts as one. Right, <laughs> I mean, it's, right. It's a great scene. It's just, you know. Yeah. Well, so um, uh, let's let's talk real quick about any kind of outlying interesting sorts of things um, that we have. I we You mentioned earlier Old Man Willow and Fangorn. Um, it was interesting to kind of see him. I'd forgotten that he was brought in. Uh, obviously, Old Man Willow is actually um, a tree of the old forest, not of Fangorn. So, oh, so is that, is that what was happening when when, uh, when uh, Mary and Pippin are like in, like engulfed eaten? in the trees? They're engulfed yeah. in the trees. I yeah. was wondering what was happening there. I was yeah. like, and then and then um, and then Treebeard comes along and says yeah. Tom Bombadil's words, right? Says Tom oh, Bombadil's words to Old Man Willow. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, tells him to go back to sleep, right? Right. The, um, yeah. yeah, that was like, okay, cool, there's the tree, but wrong book. Um, I think maybe even the wrong hobbits and then the wrong hero. And well, def- like, Mary and Pippin are, are, are part of that, but uh, but Frodo and Sam are as well. In, but Frodo in the was there too, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it felt like oh, maybe yeah. they, they, they'd they gone to the trouble to make all these digital assets for the movie, and then maybe it got cut, <sighs> you know, because they cut Tom Bombadil, and they're like, well, you know, we spent all this money on this how do we work it into the film and it, it felt really forced it yeah. did feel very yeah it really didn't seem like it well it is an extended scene isn't it yeah. Josh is the, it, uh, uh, the old man, man Willow scene yeah. yeah oh okay yeah so I can see why they left that one out um, I, it was I mean it's a little fun to see it I guess but and see it, at least some aspect really of, the, of the Tom Bombadil yeah. old forest stuff portrayed but um, you know it wasn't yeah it was kind of out of place yeah um, the Gollum split personality scene we talked about that briefly mm-hmm. earlier. Um, I think I think that I love. To me, that's something that Jackson took a little bit of, and he kind of expounded upon it a little bit more and did his own thing with it. And I think it works extremely well. Mm-hmm. Um, to, it's a really good insight into to Gollum's give, yeah, character to like, and backstory. To just yeah, go deeply into Gollum's psyche. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What do y'all What do y'all think about that? That scene. Gollum split personality. That's in the theatrical, is it not? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's a great scene. Yeah. Um, that is, that's probably one of the best scenes, I think, in that film. Um, along with the very end where Frodo, Sam, and Gollum are walking, uh, and they're walking towards, uh, Minas Morgul. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, they're, they're having dialogue that I think happens much earlier in the book. Uh, I think the dialogue that they're having happens before Faramir captures them, and it's about uh, uh, Sam wondering if they'll ever make stories about Faramir. Oh, right, yeah. right, yeah. right, right. yeah. And it happens, in the book it happens much earlier, but I think I like it a lot more where it happens mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's it's that last bit of hope that you have um, right before, if you were to watch all these films chronologically, right before you get to Return of the King. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and, and there is a bit of hopefulness, and there's uh, there's some humor, you know, and there's uh, an intense amount of respect, and then uh, 
the last person who has any dialogue is Gollum, and Gollum has, you know, very ominous words, and, you know, mm-hmm. throughout the Two Towers film, uh, I, I sort of think that that's like the love, the, <laughs> the love letter to Gollum, yeah. because you're, you're, you're seeing, like, he's the character who gets the most development during that film, uh, second probably only to, I'd probably say Sam, you know, maybe Sam or Aragorn sort of get half of that, um, because The Return of the King is just Sam's film. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you see so much of his, like, internal struggle and all the development that he has and the regression, mm-hmm. uh, which makes the opening scene of Return of the King great, mm-hmm. you know, when you see Smeagol and all this stuff. And it, it's really, it, it, it's fantastic. Um Yeah. I think his scenes in the two towers are much better than uh the scenes in Return of the King. Yeah. Will? Um I I don't have a lot to add to, to the the Smeagol Gollum. No, and if you want if you want to mention something, you know, else that was interesting okay. to you, we're kinda of doing a I think we, we wanna do kind of a final wrap up of any other things sure. that you wanted to make sure we covered. So So this this is pretty minor, but um there's a there's a sound effect in the movie called the Wilhelm scream. Yes, uh, is that what that's called? That? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's oh! yeah that's... so so yeah, the, yeah, the, the yell and so there's a the scene. Where What's the, the deal with that? Is that is that because uh, I first heard it in like a Star Wars movie, one of the Star Wars that, movies. Yeah, that's that's a big like movie effect. Yeah, they like it's, it's just like a running joke amongst like sound it's, effects. Yeah, guys. so it was yeah. stock uh, sound effect in the from like the. The 30s or the 50s or something. Uh-huh. So it was like a, it's like an open source sound effect. And so you could just, if you need a guy dying, you would just put that sound in. <laughs> falling, so, falling to his death. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, when so the, Star Wars, the Rohan uh, warrior gets like thrown over the ledge of Helm's Deep? Yeah. 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 yeah it's right when the orc ladders show up. And, but it, in Star Wars, it's, I think, a stormtrooper, you know, when Luke and Leia are swinging across the bridge. And um, it became yeah. a rough joke to put it into all the Star Wars and the Indiana Jones movies. So I've kind of taught my kids who are watching all these movies. I'm like, oh, there's the scream. Listen for the scream. And <laughs> they like, over 300 movies. So as you're watching the movie, you'll, you're, you'll hear oh, that no scream. Oh, no way. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Was that it? Here you go. Here you go. Here it is. Yeah, that was, that was one of the few things where uh, when I got my girlfriend to watch all six Star Wars films would be at the time for so episode seven. Every time it came up, I would just shout, Wilhelm scream! Yeah. Ah! And he not. <laughs> yeah, so it was, just, it was just fun to see it in there. And, and um, I don't know if it's in the other two Lord of the Rings movies, but um, it's just something fun to listen for while you're watching a movie because it's... It's very overused. <laughs> it's an inside film joke. Yeah. That's really interesting. I, I, definitely I didn't picked know up, it had a name. I, I, I thought after, you know, a few years ago, after hearing that again in a movie, I was like, I've heard that in, like, every movie. I wonder if it's some kind of, like, running <laughs> joke. So it's good to know what that's actually called. Wilhelm. Yeah. Name for the guy that created it, I'm assuming? Uh, Maybe? It first appeared in 1951 for the film Distant Drums. The Wilhelm scream is often used when someone is either falling. It doesn't say who it was made for, but uh, oh, okay. hold on. There's a Wikipedia article about it. Oh, okay. Uh, it's really not says, that big a deal. Uh, named after Private Wilhelm, a character in The Charge at Feather River. Oh, a 1953 Western. Yeah. So Wait, I didn't realize it went back that far. Wow, I thought it actually originated in Star Wars. That's interesting. Well, Will yeah. said it was either from the 30s or 50s. Yeah. So he was right, 50s. It's, it was a ways back, but mm-hmm. um, it's just it's a fun thing to mm-hmm. listen for. Watch Absolutely, no, that's cool. Yeah. It just More popped up. And, some of the things that you'll hear it in. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like, yeah. oh, wow, that's a Will home screen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, that's great. What else? What other final wrap-up items we want to mention that we haven't said anything about yet? Uh, Again, this is like kind of minor, but when um, when Aragorn and Gandalf and Gimli and Legolas arrive at Edoras, and Hama is like, you know, kind of being the, the bodyguard and like, uh-huh. you know, trying to protect Theoden or whatever, there was not much of a standoff no, there, there in the movie, and I kind of wish there had been more to yeah. that. Because I thought that was a, one of a very enjoyable scene for me in the little, book. A little Hama's. more development for Hama. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. More development for Hama. 
Yeah, yeah. that's what I would have liked to have seen that. But I mean, it was fine. I can I, see why they left it out. That's a good point. I mean, yeah, I can see why they did. But uh, but yeah, Hama Hama definitely is a little bit more developed in the book. And uh, yes, he's more. He's, of not, a minor he's not a major character, character but uh, yeah. he's not even a major minor character. But he's a he's kind of a medium minor character, I guess. You know, he's medium not he's not just character. he's there not background. Go. He's got a right. He's got an interesting little. A uh, few episodes there, so yeah, yeah. Would like yeah. To see. He was at least in the movie. At least they actually had yes. him cast in the movie. Yes, so. uh, yes, that's true. Uh, that's true. It could have yeah. been worse. Yeah. Will or Josh? Any other final thoughts? Um. Oh God, final thoughts. Well, then I'll I'll say two, two things, which. Uh, Josh, Josh still has, like, a, a huge list. I know. We'll have to give John, <laughs> like, so, yeah, Josh's well, own episode. The, the problem is I, I have, like, uh, these things that I remember very late in the game, and I'm like, oh, we're not going to talk about this now, so I'll just leave this open to interpretation. Um, I I don't think that they could have done the film any other way. Uh-huh. Um, and I say that because, yes, there is a whole part of The Return of the King, the book, that we don't get uh, in cinematic form. And I... I I don't think it could have been done without, uh, without probably having three four hour films, uh, and even then, cutting out all cutting out all the unnecessary stuff to sort of add more things from the book. Um, so it's it's disappointing that because of how and it's really this uh, on, on fault quote unquote of this film that we don't have a lot of things that come out later in Return of the King. You know, we don't have the whole scourging of the Shire and we don't Mm -hmm. have uh, 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 the touch of the King, you know, when when Aragorn goes and visits the sick and he heals them. Yes, there you go. Um, And it's a shame we don't have them, but everything ends up working out, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's... it's the lack of those story elements that prompt you to go read the books. Yeah, so true. I'm true. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Uh, the other the other thing is I I've gone back and forth on which pairing of towers as an interpretation I enjoy more because I know Professor Tolkien had his own that he you know he spent decades deciding on which he thought were uh, proper for the novel mm-hmm. and. I know PJ has a certain interpretation as well, and I would like PJ's interpretation if the story of Saruman was more of that in the book than how he is portrayed in the film. Because in the film, he's just a glorified servant. Yes, Whereas in the book, he That's does have his own. Good point. We we didn't, we didn't mention that yet, and yeah, Saruman is uh, continues to mm-hmm. be just a uh, one of maybe a major pawn, but one of Sauron's pawns. You know, he's subservient yeah. to Sauron, whereas in the book, he. He's trying. He's playing. He's trying to set himself up as an alternate Sauron, which is important because that's one of the whole. That's one of the deep themes of the Lord of the Rings is the struggle. The struggle for power and the like, wanting to be in control and be one of the mighty. And Saruman's fall is not that he just becomes. He decides to go from serving God to serving the devil. It's that he says, "Well, I can. I can pit myself against the devil and set myself up as a great power." Um, but that's his fault. That that is his actual fault, and that's a much more subtle form of evil. But it's also a much more realistic form of mm-hmm. of evil. You know, that's yeah. that's more true to the human condition, right? Like, right, right. It's what we actually do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Anyway, so, I don't want to steal, steal I, your thunder, Josh. Go ahead. No, no. But you know, so I like. I think I like PJ's interpretation of uh, the two towers being uh, Orthanc and Barador, but it it just doesn't end up working with the story that he was telling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it doesn't end up working as best. You know, it, it works because what he's saying is there is a union, which is something that Saruman himself says in the, the film. It's a dialogue. Uh, there's a union of these two towers. And that works. I think that, you know, uh, how Professor Tolkien writes it might have been a different story and still using those two towers because there's a, there's a rivalry. There's a competition that Sauron doesn't see mm-hmm. and that Sauron is trying to instigate mm-hmm. and then you know we know how that all flies out but uh no you know then I go back and I you know oh maybe it's Minas Morgul and it's Minas Tirith and all this stuff and it makes sense or or uh Isengard Minas Morgul you know it, it makes sense because then you have like there's two stories being told there's a story against Orthanc and then there's a story leading towards Minas Morgul and I think we talked about this in one of our episodes on the two towers at some point it came up about like the different 
the name of the book and then how there's different ways you can understand what's meant by the name of the book. You know, even, I mean, Tolkien may have, Professor Tolkien may have had one of his own interpretations, but a favorite interpretation, but there's definitely different ways you can, you can look at it. Yeah. So and that's one of the and fun things about the mm-hmm, title. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And he's got letters, he's got letters talking about why he thinks one pairing is better than the other and all these different things going on. So, uh, that, that's it for me. <laughs> Cool. All right, Will. Any last thoughts? Um, no, you know this is my first time through the books, and I haven't. Um, I'm just starting on uh, Return of the King, and I'm waiting on uh, Silmarillion. And um, I, I don't. I don't think I can add anything that uh, you all haven't covered and summarized really well. Um, one one thing is I I'm really excited about the um, the new Baron and Luthien book that just came out. Mm-hmm. And I was reading uh, the preface to your book, John, again, and I was just thinking how exciting that must be for you to have this story come out in the form that it's come out. You know, I think it was just this month, right? Yeah, it was the beginning of June. Um, yeah, so, so that's that's got to be amazing. And I'm looking forward to reading that, too. But I, I'm i not the Tolkien scholar yet that <laughs> the rest of you guys are, so I, well, I don't have too much more to add. The thing that feels so true about Tolkien, is, as opposed to many other writers, is like it's his – his works, his works are so deep, and all, of, and, and even the works that have come after he's you know, he's died are are just so deep. His universe is so deep that it just feels like it's impo- Like it's it's almost like um, wrong for anyone to refer to themselves as an expert on Tolkien. Like you could be an expert <laughs> on other things, but Tolkien is just not something you feel. You know, it's I think much. anybody can rightfully call themselves an expert of. There are probably degrees of like, you know, having knowledge and that kind of thing, but you just you just you continually learn. He's unmasterable, you know, because mm-hmm. of the vastness of everything he did. That's that's my view of it, at least. Um, you know, it's just, and and that's one of the beautiful things about his works is they they're so there's so much variance in the way and what you bring to them as a reader. Um, and this is important to him that you you don't he wasn't trying to tell you this didactic story at any times. He was trying to tell a story uh, that you come to it as a reader and. Uh, and your mind just falls in love with it and does all that would, that it will do with it. Mm-hmm. So, which, mm-hmm. you know, and I think he held that up as the best form of storytelling. Yeah, and I think, I, yeah, I I think that's the best thing that uh, Peter Jackson's films have done, really, is they're a, uh, an appetizer to mm-hmm. that world. Yes. You know, for, yes. I think, a lot of people. Yeah. So very, I'm grateful. Very, very big appetizer. Made. It's like the it's like the blooming yes, onion. Yes. The blooming <laughs> onion, <laughs> right? Yes. It's, uh, it, what is it, Outback Steakhouse? Outback, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, just like yeah, this isn't like a little uh, you know a couple of ch- you know, chips or something. This is the blooming onion. These movies, but uh, yes. yeah, they are definitely appetizers. So, final word, hey people, uh, if you've only watched the movies and you're finding this episode, um, go get the books and read them for crying out loud. Because as wonderful as the movies are, and we do believe they're wonderful, um, they are they are a beginning into an incredible world that Tolkien mm-hmm. gave us with mm-hmm. his books, The Lord of the Rings, and. Uh, and then you get into the Silmarillion and all of his other works. So yeah, uh, go buy the books. Absolutely, I think that's a good lead in. We have one haiku I wanted to share. Okay, we're gonna let we're gonna do one haiku from uh, is it Greg UK? Greg UK, yeah, who we haven't heard from in a while. So we're gonna do one yeah. haiku for him, unless Will or Josh happen to write a haiku. I don't know, but we we didn't write we didn't write haiku. We weren't planning on doing yeah, haiku we, time. Yeah. So oh, I don't I don't have one. No, okay. I'm, I'm completely unprepared for that. So this okay. is good because Greg UK, of course, is the guy who uh, invented our lyrics for right. our haiku song. For the haiku song. Um, yeah. We, I, I won't. I don't have the song queued up, so I won't play it, but. You, okay. can, you can go ahead and read his haiku. Okay. Let him have the final word. Yes. Uh, from Greg UK, he says, I did like the film. There was lots of cool fighting. The book's better, though. That's that's a fitting final word. <laughs> yes, I thought it would be very fitting. <laughs> well done, Greg. Yes, well done. Yes. That's great. Good wrap-up. All right. Well, Josh, Will, really appreciate you guys yes, thank uh, you hopping so much. on here and having yeah. this conversation for uh, two hours with us. This is, I think, it's, I think it was great. Um, it was super and fun. You know, yeah. great. After I think we did it by ourselves last time we for did. fellowship, and uh, mm-hmm. now I kind of wish we could go back and and do do it with these guys. But um, hey, uh, maybe maybe one of these days, okay. maybe we'll see. Uh, but really appreciate your all's time yes. and uh, for spending yes. two hours with us. Yes. And on Saturday, thanks yeah. everybody for listening, and we will talk at you next time. Yes, thanks guys. Right. Thank you. Bye bye, y'all.
Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll sit down with a special guest to discuss some of their Tolkien-related projects. After that, we'll resume our journey through The Lord of the Rings with Minas Tirith, Book 5, Chapter 1. Please send haiku or other correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on. 